Good afternoon, everyone. Um, happy to see everybody on this pretty gray and snowy day. It feels a little Christmassy, but we're into the end of January, if you can imagine. Um, glad to see you all again for the continuation from our January 18th meeting. Um, so I won't be I won't be uh, so much starting our meeting, but we're going to be continuing where we left off. And I just wanted to let folks know that the clerk's office did send around an agenda um, that does have the color coded items that um, remain on our agenda today. So for the public, uh, we'll, we'll be jumping back and forth a little bit through the existing agenda, but we have uh, not too, too much left to, to cover today, I hope. <laughs> Anyhow, um, before we start, I just want to begin by acknowledging we are gathered here today very gratefully in Unamagi, the unceded and ancestral territory of the Mi'kmaq, always working within the spirit of peace, friendship, or the treaties of peace and friendship uh, and in the spirit of reconciliation and education. Uh, so I will ask Tanya just to call the roll to see uh, we have an attendance now. I just want to acknowledge we have a couple counselors that are running a little bit late, but will be joining um, shortly. Go ahead, Tanya. Okay. Mayor McDougall. Present. Councillor Gordon McDonald. Here. Deputy Mayor McMullen. Councillor Cyril McDonald. Here. Councillor Gillespie. Here. Councillor Eldon McDonald. Here. Councillor Perouche. Here. Councillor Parsons. Here. Councillor Edwards. Here. Councillor Tracy. Here. Councillor Brookswagger. Here. Councillor O'Quinn. Here. Councillor Green. Hey, thank you so kindly, Tanya. So we'll jump back into this and we're going to start today with item 7.2. <clears throat> Business arising from Council, uh, our meeting of December 14th, 2021. Uh, so with us, we have our community consul Sorry about that. Community consultation coordinator, Mike Target. That phone never rings. It scared me. I'm sorry about that. Um, so what, what Mike is going to do today uh, is, is a direct request from that meeting of where all the items in our, strategic, our draft strategic vision stand right now. Um, the question was asked of him to provide that list, indicating who is responsible for each of the items, where the item stands, is that item resourced or do we have to find resourcing from it? Um, and Mike is also gonna go into a bit of the um, community consultation piece. So how we're going to take this and go out to the community. Now, we had intended actually this week to be hosting town hall sessions in our communities, but unfortunately because of COVID, we are unable to host these large scale um, gatherings of the community. So Mike and staff here at the CBRM have been working really, really hard um, along with our, our staff and the brilliant mind. We were talking about the importance of accountants um, of Jennifer Campbell really leading the way to make sure we can present our budget information, our vision uh, information, to the public in a way that they can really interact with it. So we're in the process of pivoting a bit, but you're going to see some really wonderful um, videos that are going to be available to the public, a survey where we can gather some feedback, and we'll have all of that information by the time we go back to uh, budget consultations. So for the time being, I'm going to hand it over to Mike Target. Thanks, Mayor. I'm going to share my screen. I'm also just gonna turn off my video because uh, I'm also having some intermittent internet issues. So everyone can hear me and everyone can see my screen. Okay, so uh, as the mayor said, as per council's direction, I'm, uh, I'm gonna give you an update on the items from your strategic vision that are considered immediate. Uh, and so this means items that have already been completed or are currently underway or are uh, low hanging fruit that could be undertaken immediately. So I'm, I'm definitely not going to go through the document that you've all been provided in your agenda. 
I'm just going to give some general comments, and this will take less than 10 minutes. Uh, I'll just note that for anyone watching who does want to see the document and uh, the breakdown of the priority areas and their action items and the responses from staff, those can be found in the agenda document for this meeting, which I believe starts around page uh, 80. So uh, because we were unable to hold any in-person workshop type conversations, like I talked about at the last presentation with staff, uh, I instead distributed a document to staff here at the CBRM, staff at the REN and staff at the Port of Sydney Development Corporation. And the document contained the five priority areas broken down into their 22 individual items or goals, uh, one item or goal per page. And most of those items contain between one and three specific actions. And like I said, I'm not gonna go over these individually. Anyone who wants to look can find them in the agenda. So I will just give you an example um, for anyone who's watching. So for example, priority area number two, which is the CBRM charter, and then the item or goal number 2.3, which is to re-engage the charter committee. And then that contains two specific action items to achieve that goal. So staff were asked to respond to the document as follows, whether an item was done currently underway, uh, whether they recommend to begin immediately or whether it requires development. If an item was currently underway, they were asked to, you know, to estimate the percentage of progress to date. Uh, you know, if possible, granting this is, you know, sometimes difficult to quantify. If an item was recommended to begin immediately, they were asked likewise to estimate the time it would take to complete. And if an item required development, uh, I just made separate notes for a future presentation. So then they were asked to identify the lead person or department. And lastly, to provide any details about the progress, uh, which is what you've got in front of you. Uh, and again, just to reiterate, anyone watching who wants to see the progress on the strategic vision items to date can read them in the agenda. Uh, I also just want to stop for a second and thank uh, the staff for responding to my request for input, because I know that, you know, a lot of people have been struggling to balance a lot of things over these last few weeks and months. So, you know, big appreciation to um, CBRM staff, Tyler Mathis at the REN and uh, Paul Kerrigan and Marlene Nusher at the Port of Sydney Development Corporation. So as you can see from the report, councillors that you have in front of you, uh, half or 50%, which is 11 of the 22 items are either underway or recommended to begin immediately. And the other half, the remaining 11 out of 22, uh, staff indicated that they require development. However, for, for even for many of the items that were reported as needing development, um, even though there wasn't necessarily any tangible progress for me to report, there was often still information to convey. So for example, uh, item 1.2, which is refreshing the branding website and wayfinding signage. Uh, there was some info there about potential funding for the municipal capacity grant or from rather from the municipal capacity grant. Um, and item 4.2, which was population growth and inclusivity. Uh, the, the specific action was to review CBRM hiring policies to participate in immigration programs. So in that one, you'll see that human resources identified themselves as the lead. Uh, human resources noted that they would pr be pursuing this in the future, supported by the REN, and then additionally, the REN reported that they will be developing this um, into a, a service for local businesses. I'll also highlight the fact that many of the items include this note, recommendations from CBRM Forward will inform this. So as the CBRM Forward project finalizes uh, your municipal planning strategy and your economic development strategy, these will provide recommendations or tactics for how to accomplish uh, many of the goals in your strategic vision. That's gonna, I think, do a lot of the heavy lifting. Likewise, the REN also reported that their own upcoming business plan can include tactics to support many of the goals in your strategic vision. So, so the last thing I'll say about a specific item 
is that engineering and public works, uh, when they were reporting on item 5.3, which is new sources of revenue related to waste disposal, um, they reported that research is ongoing and provided details on that research, but because it was outside the scope of this particular report on the immediate items that are currently underway, um, I'm going to provide that information in, uh, uh, in a forthcoming document later. So as the mayor said, the next step in this process is budget consultations, which will be happening in February, and this includes a survey on the strategic vision priority areas. And I'll bring that feedback back to council at a future update, um, presumably along with progress, another progress report on the, the 22 items that you have in front of you today in possibly a workshop similar to the format that kicked off this whole process to begin with. You know, kind of like how we talked about at the last pres or my last presentation to you in December. Um, at, at, at which point more progress will presumably have been made on the items that are currently underway and presumably some of the items that are that currently uh, fall under the required development category will have moved into the underway category uh, by then. So uh, I'll finish my presentation here with a comment about the slide that I showed you at my last presentation. Uh, in December, which th this this was a, sh a chart illustrating how to get from vision to action. And uh, I'm just going to skip in the interest of time to my next slide, which th this is um, just simply an updated version uh, of that same slide where you now see staff input uh, is now at the front. Uh, the front end of this, because the survey has moved to position number four, after budget consultations. And budget consultations is now a part of the strategic vision to action process. Because you know, hopefully uh, what we'll see is in future years and future budgets, you, you'll, you'll be able to see how the strategic vision sort of ends up in next year's budget uh, and so on, you know, moving forward every year. You'll also see here that the box labeled execute, which is uh, now along the bottom and spans the length of the chart. It, it, I sort of taken it outside of the chart and put it on its own. When I first presented this chart in December, I kind of just skipped over this label, uh, this box labeled execute. And I said something like, you know, that that part's not my job. Uh, and I focused instead on the, the communication uh, part, which made up a lot of my presentation in December, which, which is the part I've been tasked with. Now what I've done is I've simply just placed the, the, the box labeled execute entirely outside the stuff that I'm working on and made it span the length of the chart in, in order really to just acknowledge and emphasize that um, a lot of this work already has begun, just like you guys um, I, uh, indicated at the last council meeting. And it is underway. It continues to progress from staff, from the REN, uh, and from the Port Development Corporation. And also just to emphasize that the part I'm personally working on are what we call the key learnings and next step recommendations that are taken from your initial draft strategic vision report. And this is my last slide, just like it was in my last presentation. I just wanna go over these again, because uh, I think they're really useful to emphasize the part that I'm working on. So one, create a mechanism for implementing the actions outlined in the strategic vision and assigning a staff person as lead. Two, giving CBRM residents a, a mechanism for holding CBRM accountable to the actions laid out in the strategic vision. Sorry, my kid's just walking in from school right now if you hear any noise in the background. Three, creating open channels of communications regarding the progress on these items. Four, gathering residents' ideas and feedback. And lastly, five, bringing a review of the strategic vision to council every quarter uh, to help you assess its progress. So that's the end of my presentation. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. So again, this is business arising from our last meeting. So this is, you know, an opportunity for us to have a chat, ask any questions you would like. Again, because we were shut down, we couldn't hold that in-person workshop, unfortunately, but are looking forward to coming back together as a group. Um, on the speakers list so far, I have Councillor Steve Parsons. Thank you, Madam Mayor. <clears throat> through you to Michael. Michael, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I did go through your detailed uh, uh, 
input in the agenda. And I just, just have a couple of questions I want to make reference to, just for clarity reasons, I guess. Uh, section 2.1 under the Charter and CBRM. Uh, I'm reading it and it says, not sure a charter is necessary. These are in the edited comments. There's a recommendation that not sure if a charter is necessary. And it also describes HRM's charter is largely a duplicate of the MGA. I guess from my perspective is, is this a recommendation of yourself self based on communication discussions with perhaps anybody from CBR uh, from HRM or is it just your, your understanding of the MGA and or I just like to know where would that recommendation come from as relates to uh, HRM's uh, charter because my understanding of a charter is that these are things outside of the MGA that we would want to do without always going to ask for permission for. Uh, from the province. So I, I guess ultimately that's, that will be my first question. And number two, in essence of timing, is in related relation to 3.2, the ongoing and open communications with the Port of Sydney. Again, there's a recommendation in, uh, in the edited comments in your report that basically recommends quarterly discussions between the port management with CBRM administration. And again, uh, I'd like to understand that because of course the port's board Direct, uh, reports directly to uh, uh, the board of directors of the Sydney Port. So I need to understand that who's making the recommendation to come back to council to, is it not to council, it's administration actually, just as a quarterly update, which in turn would certainly come to council. But I'm just wondering where that recommendation is coming from, knowing that they have a uh, their own board that they report to. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Councillor Parsons. Um, so at each of my presentations, uh, I make at least one error. The error that I made this time is that I didn't provide a legend for the initials that follow each of the comments. So in, in each of where it says detail slash description and there's text in red, um, these all come from staff. And then following the, the, the text, there is um, square brackets with someone's initials in them. So, so for example, PC is Paul Kerrigan at the Port of Sydney, TM is Tyler Mathis at the REN, DCR is Deborah Campbell Ryan, the clerk, um, MR is Michael Roos, which is the one that we're talking about here too, about the CBRM charter. Uh, JC is Jennifer Campbell, CFO. WM is Wayne McDonald, Director of Engineering, and DE is Deanna Evely, Director of Human Resources. Uh, so for those comments related to the charter, the majority of the ones that you mentioned are from Director Michael Roos. I tried as, as best I could um, not to edit or, I mean, I don't want to use the word censor, but I tried not to edit uh, a lot of what was coming in. I did edit it for clarity and brevity, but uh, I wanted to communicate what staff wanted to communicate to council. So, I mean, if you have a specific question about those answers. I mean, maybe if Director Roos is here, he, he could answer that. Yeah, maybe. Now that I understand your acronyms, maybe, uh, maybe I could direct that question, Madam Mayor, to Michael Roos, Director of Planning. Thank you. Go ahead, question, uh, Councillor. Um, in regards to the comment that I made on this item, um, largely, largely just making the point that probably before deciding that a charter is necessary, uh, that it would probably be worthwhile to determine what items that aren't currently provided in the Municipal Government Act that council and staff um, would want included. And if the provincial government was interested in making an amendment to the MGA, um, because if so, uh, then a charter would likely not be necessary as long as the tools are provided in some form. Thank you, Director. Did you, you still have about 30 seconds, Councillor, if you had anything else you want to add? And the port question as it relates to quarterly meetings. I didn't know, again, who whose recommendation that was. Um, okay, so we were talking about, I'm sorry, was that item 3.1? No, that was item 3.2? Correct. Right, so um, 
Paul Kerrigan responded to this saying that the Port of Sydney Development Corporation currently reports to CBRM monthly uh, on financial information via the CFO and currently reports to CBRM annually at its AGM. And then, so, so that's was sort of a, an answer to the, the suggestion that ongoing and open communication with the Port of Sydney Development Corporation would um, be beneficial. So then he, he simply said that uh, they, they agree, <laughs> regular meetings quarterly between CBRM administration and port management to discuss common issues would be useful. So the reason that he indicated this was currently underway is because there, there exists already some mechanisms for communication, but then he also was just, I think, acknowledging that um, there could be an improvement to that. That's the gist that I got from it. Does okay, that answer? And, and, and thank oh, you for your sorry, answer. Sorry, that's your time. Good, thank you. Come My on. apologies, uh, Madam CAO. I was paying attention to the chat, trying to keep track of the uh, speakers list. I missed your hand up there. No worries. I was just going to um, comment on the whole charter issue. Uh, when we met, met with Municipal Affairs the last time and some of the council were there, that was their message, that just determine what you are looking for, give it to us, and it's their job to either create the legislation or change the MGA, determine whether it's a regional charter that we need or it's something that can be built into the MGA. So I think the issue is we need to decide what we want, and they'll tell us what tools that we need. Thank you, Madam CAO. And just as a point of information, um, since our last meeting, uh, I did reach out to the Charter Committee um, to try to figure out some availability. And there is a meeting to reconvene that committee. Um, in the coming weeks, I don't know, I can't remember what it is off the top of my head, but, um, and I stated very clearly to the committee, it's such a timely, um, opportunity for us to to get that list of what we want what do we need um, to ask permissions for or authority for because of that review of the mga so uh, that is also happening as well so next we have councillor james edwards in the speaking in the speakers list and i just want to acknowledge councillor gordon mcdonald is having some technical difficulties um and he's just saying he sending his apologies if he's not participating um, as much, but yeah, everybody's at home. A lot of kids and parents at home and our internet is really being tested. So whenever you can participate, Councillor, you just let us know. Councillor James Edwards, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And uh, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Target for your uh, report. I enjoyed it. Uh, and my uh, question is uh, uh, generic in nature. Um, uh, in your org chart, you uh, um, allude to a, a survey. I wonder if I can ask you to uh, um, expand on uh, on the survey, if that would be internal or if that would be go to the public, or uh, is that uh, something that would be manipulated on a, uh, uh, on a per item basis? Uh, sure, thanks for your question, Councillor Edwards. The survey would be public. It would be distributed publicly at the same time as the um, information materials that the mayor was describing about the budget. And it would be packaged with the budget, sort of like the budget is kind of saying, here's how we spent money and the strategic vision is kind of looking to the future. So the survey will be about those strategic vision items. Uh, mainly at the kind of top level. So not digging into each of those 22 items, but just the sort of five main priority items. And it would ask questions or a question like, now these questions haven't been written because writing a survey is extremely time consuming and I'm not done yet. <laughs> um, but it would be something like uh, describing the, the main point of one priority item and then asking a question do you agree that this should be a priority of cbrm yes no or i'm ambivalent and then um there would be a, a, so there'll be basically only five questions and then there would be a sixth question which would just be a blank field asking something like um have your say did we miss anything something along those lines and then i would um compile those answers uh, responses and include it in uh, the, my next presentation to council 
as an update on the strategic vision. Very interesting, sir. And uh, that, that's uh, good to know going forward. Uh, we were in discussions uh, recently about uh, uh, perhaps uh, other surveys. What is the uh, turnaround time on a, uh, on a typical survey? I know I appreciate that it would be um, the, related to the, to, to the topic, but uh, uh, if you were going to ask for a survey uh, on any specific uh, item, uh, what, what's the uh, timeline on that? So given that in the, the quote unquote key learnings and next step recommendations from your initial draft, there was the recommendation to provide a, a quarterly update, I would imagine providing the results of that survey in my next quarterly update. So we're talking three months from now. So then sort of doing a work back schedule from that um, means I would be compiling the results of that survey in the weeks preceding that. I would probably run the survey for about a month and uh, it won't be released for another month. So um, yeah, so to then go in the opposite direction, it'll be released in about a month, it'll run for about a month, it'll take a couple of weeks to compile and then I'll present it three months from now. Gotcha, now is this something that you would do uh, on your own or would you be in collaboration with, for example, the communications director? I will absolutely be working with the communications director on this, yes. Wonderful. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thanks, Councillor. Next, we have Councillor Darren Brookschweiger. Uh, thanks, Mayor, and thanks, Mike, for your, your presentation again today. Um, so, Mike, just on the, the survey again, are you going to try to cover every part of this? Is that what you're thinking about uh, before I go on further? No, so the idea would be to uh, only cover the five priority areas okay. at that top level. That's it. Just that. Okay. So number five, the diversified revenue sources, right? And you brought it up here today and it was discussed once at council was the sewer. And you said sewer today because staff have discussed that as a possible uh, way of changing things. They're charging the sewer tax similar to our water bills. You pay for what's coming in, same as what's going out or any formula that they want to throw at the table later for discussion. Um, with that, as you know, or most know, uh, who have sewer, we pay sewer tax on our bills. It's a sewer tax. It's so much on the hundred that we pay for sewer. Uh, in most cases, people pay 500 a year for water on average. So you're going to pay the same HRM, it's, you pay the same amount for sewer that goes out. So hopefully, as the survey goes out, you'll be able to roll out how much it would actually cost extra for this for, for customers or rough approximates. Because if it's in the survey, that's the time you want to hear from the people, right? Because I haven't heard anybody tell me they want to pay more money for services lately. And uh, it's certainly something, a good point to get that survey at that time, Mike, you know. So maybe you can speak to Director McDonald and, and uh, Jennifer Campbell about some of this discussion because it was discussed at council previous. And although sewer wasn't mentioned in the document today, you brought it up. So it is important that we're open and transparent with the public on this stuff if we're going to do that survey. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. Thanks for your comments, Councillor. Uh, next, we have Councillor Steve Gillespie. Thank you, Mayor McDougall, and thanks very much, Mike, for the presentation, uh, not only to you, but to the staff members that participated in it as well. Uh, I'd also like to thank you, Mike, uh, for getting this to us in what I would consider a, a fairly timely fashion. I mean, we only talked about this last spring. Uh, we only started agreeing on some of the uh, the points that we thought were important, our big five, I think is what we're calling them. And, and then to, you know, to get information out to staff and to even have a presentation back to us in a reasonable amount of time, I think is uh, very much appreciated by this council. Uh, I have a, a number of questions, but I, I'm just going to leave the uh, charter questions alone because we've had those discussions and we do have a charter meeting coming up. 
Um, when it comes to your revenue sources and increased revenue sources, are we looking at creating new revenue sources or are we looking at going to municipalities in Atlanta, Canada, as I always like to do when I'm looking for changes uh, and see what they do? Uh, places like St. John and St. John's, uh, Moncton, uh, Charlottetown, uh, you know, in uh, areas that that have a similar uh, population base and uh, similar taxation rates and stuff. Like that. I'm just wondering if that is something that we're looking at doing, you know, the no, in, no reason to reinvent the wheel type of thing. So that's, uh, that's question one. Uh, question two is regarding the harbors. And I'm just going to play a little devil's advocate here if I can. And when we were discussing this last spring uh, during our meetings, we were talking about, you know, developing Sydney Harbor, making it. And then other councillors were concerned that maybe their harbors were being left out. Now, I hear a lot about Lewisburg Harbor, but I don't hear that much about uh, the North Sydney Harbor and the Glace Bay Harbor. And I'm wondering... Has any thought been put into, instead of the port of Sydney just taking over and running all of the, the harbors in our in municipality, uh, has any thought uh, had in there? Because we obviously have a board, we obviously have a group of people, we obviously have those employees who are doing that, but it seems that their focus is strictly just on one harbor. Uh, so I would just ask that if I could. Um, uh, last but not least, um, you know, when, when we start talking about the economic development uh, of our CBRM and we start talking about modernization and that kind of thing, one thing that always bothers me is that website and wayfinding signs. Uh, um, our website isn't great. Uh, and we know it's not great. And I've talked to John McKinnon about this many times. And, and, and it really, when you compare it to other municipalities, not to say it's not a good one where it is now, but the comparison, I don't know if I would want to combine uh, a whole new signage strategy with just fixing the website. Isn't that something that we could break up into two different things? Those are my three questions. Thank you. Uh, thanks for your questions, Councillor Gillespie. So the, um, the first one about diversified revenue sources. So item 5.2, it's um, investigating the feasibility to develop, to develop new sources of revenue related to waste disposal. And it, it's sub items, or I guess it's specific action items are twofold. One is to engage outside experts to determine the feasibility of this. So I imagine that the answer is yes, to your question. And the second is to consult with municipal colleagues across Nova Scotia for best practices in this regard. So I think that also is yes in answer to your question. And then in the details and description section on, on this item, uh, Tyler Mathis from the REN also indicated where you see it says B, he said access to the Nova Scotia REN network may be useful here. So I think he was, he was specifically answering um, Item B, consulting with municipal colleagues and suggesting that a way to, to do that would be through the REN. So I think the answer to your first question is yes. Um, and if uh, if, this, if the if the CFO or, or Director Wayne would like to elaborate on that when I'm done, please by all means do so. Uh, the second question about the port, I didn't hear anything like that, and I actually just don't think I'm the best person to answer that question at all. Um, if anyone disagrees, please let me know. And then the third question about the website and the, 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 the wayfinding. Um, I agree, <laughs> I agree with what you said. That's it, thank you. If, if I might, Councillor Gillespie, um, yes. one thing that I've noticed over my, my, my years on council and, and now sitting in this seat is develop Nova Scotia really, it, like, that is their mandate for not solely one harbor, but all commercial harbors and, and opportunities in, in Nova Scotia. And we've seen great, I, I want to say leadership and direction being offered by Develop Nova Scotia when it comes to developing our harbors and waterways. So for example, uh, the revitalization study that was done for Glace Bay really focused on what kind of de development could happen in and around that harbor, what could be commercial, what would be socioeconomic, um, inclusive in infrastructure. They really do um, 
not only have the purse strings to pull for that type of work, but um, have the expertise as well. So it might, you know, we're all invited to the AGM that's coming up um, for the Port of Sydney. And I think this is a really worthwhile conversation. Uh, offering this type of insight is that that's the form to have. So just wanted to put that out there that Develop Nova Scotia has a lot of work on it. And so to have that local lead would be, could be complimentary. Thank you. Okay, so I see no further folks on the speakers list. Uh, again, this was uh, this agenda item was for information purposes only. It's going to be a regular and standing item on our agenda as, as things progress. And I know Mike had mentioned uh, quarterly kind of check-ins on this, but if something does come up, I mean, after the charter committee reconvenes and work happens, we might need to have uh, a sooner uh, check-in on this. So we will, you know, we'll play this by ear, we'll do as much work as possible on this as we move forward. But I know the next item on our agenda, actually, oh, I have another question there from Council James Edwards. Go ahead, James. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And, and just, uh, I didn't mean to interrupt you there, but uh, you alluded to a point uh, and another question and I was going to ask there something that uh, Mike Target uh, uh, mentioned uh, in his uh, earlier speech there about uh, workshops. Are, are we uh, going to be having uh, continuous workshops uh, uh, on your uh, platform as well, uh, Mike? Uh, thanks for the question, Councillor Edwards. So I was Im imagining when I first drew that chart um, from vision to action that as more of these strategic priority areas move from underway to 50% done, 75% done, even 100% done. Um, and where some of these require development and, and may even require kind of a proposal to council, um, I was imagining, or we were imagining, the mayor and I have discussed this, we were imagining a workshop similar to InFormat, the one that kickstarted this process, where the proponent or the, you know, the lead person or lead department would make the presentation to council in a, in a workshop that maybe was, you know, just a couple of hours one afternoon, um, so that, you know, the, the folks from the port would be here to answer those questions and they would be they would be either reporting on a on a part of your strategic vision that is um almost done or they'd be proposing to you uh, a way to accomplish one of these goals does that answer your question yes uh, to to an extent uh, that uh, uh so yes there are going to be ongoing workshops and uh, um they're going to be uh, specific to uh uh, different uh, bullets within your uh, platform, right? Yes, that is correct. Yes. Great. That's great. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you all for this really great discussion. And thank you, Mike. And again, acknowledging staff for taking the time to really dig into this process as well. I saw um, the amount of work that went into this on behalf of our staff as well. So I just want to echo Mike Target's comments on that. Okay, well, Mike, thank you again, and we'll be chatting more on this. Budget uh, consultations are coming right up around the corner there, so really great to see this all coming together. Okay, we will now move council to item 8.2, which is municipal capacity grant one-time top-up. So I just, uh, just want to offer a couple of words before we dig into this uh, topic. And I know Jennifer Campbell is going to be speaking to it. Um, you know, been speaking with our CAO at length about what do we do? What do we do with this money, right? How do we best invest it? How do we best uh, increase our municipal services? And that's the intent of our municipal capacity grant uh, in general is to bring service levels up to a level comparable to other uh, jurisdictions in the province. And so, I, I do want to offer this um, before we get into this conversation that, you know, there's been a lot of conversation around, do we just take this money and defer uh, the, the amounts that people are paying on their tax bills? And, and I know Jennifer is going to speak to this a little bit more, but I, I just want to remind council that while we are incredibly, incredibly grateful for uh, our current Nova Scotia government for 
you know, sticking to their campaign promises and really recognizing the importance of doubling that municipal capacity grant. Um, we have to be cautious about how we how we use this money. If we're using this to reduce a tax rate, if we're something that is going to be recurring year and year year by year, and we are not sure what we're going to be getting next year in terms of the capacity grant or years down the line, you're running a little bit of a risk there. So once we have um, gone through the process with the Nova Scotia government around that new uh, reformation, I guess you could say, of the capacity grant and are assured a certain amount each year, I think then is a, a more reasonable and, and safer time to talk about reducing our, our tax rates. That being said, we are going to be talking about our tax rate at budget as we do every single year. And so I just wanted to put that out there that um, we don't know what we're going to get next year for capacity grants. We have to be really wise how we use it this year. Okay, Jennifer Campbell, Madam CFO, the stage is yours. Thank you, Mayor. Um, we are on page 105 of the agenda package. I have prepared a um, slide deck to try to navigate this issue paper. So just let me know if you can see that. You have this good okay great thank you okay so during the october 12th meeting of council a staff issue paper was requested concerning the one-time doubling of the municipal capacity grant and for cbrm this represents an unconditional transfer in one lump sum of um, 15 million three hundred thirty-five thousand. From a legislative or a regulatory perspective, there really are no stipulations or restrictions on how the municipality can use this funding. However, as the mayor had just indicated, until the formula for the municipal capacity grant is reviewed and finalized, and we know what we can expect from the municipal transfers going forward are going to be, um, it's really imperative that any planned use of funds not result in any future permanent increases in operating costs or loss of revenues. So priority, therefore, should really be given to those initiatives whose costs can be leveraged by other levels of government to try to really maximize and, and stretch that 15 million beyond what that 15 million is for the to generate the biggest impact for our region. It is the opinion of senior staff that the use of funds should either align with the priority areas of council strategic vision, as you saw in the previous presentation from Mike Target, contribute to one-time capital costs or reduce future operating costs to alleviate pressure on future budgets. In the past 18 months, uh, under public health restrictions that resulted in the closure of all of our municipal buildings and has forced the municipality to really reassess the delivery of day-to-day -day services and business processes, particularly those that require in-person interaction, that, such as items that require signatures, in-person, physical signatures, applications, forms, or in-person payments. Modernizing these particular processes to an online platform has been long overdue. It's something that we've been hearing that the public wants and is what citizens are now expecting. However, we really have not had the financial resources to shift from a paper-based to a web-based technology. So identified processes and services that could and should be delivered through an online or e-delivery solution are listed in the issue paper. And the main categories include website improvements with additional online capabilities, electronic solutions for statements and billing, customer and vendor payments and other process management solutions, modernized infrastructure for parking enforcement, data collection and storage, as well as public engagement tools. The projects noted above may qualify for leverage funding from the province of Nova Scotia's Municipal Innovation Fund or other funding programs. And staff recommend that a one-time investment in municipal modernization initiatives be undertaken for the development of online tools that offer expanded and more convenient options for the public to conduct business with the municipality, as well as software and web-based applications that would result in greater departmental efficiencies and operational capacity. And by increasing efficiency for business, the initiative aids in both economic development and provide tools to help with diversified revenue sources. Next is um, the library. So a library that is modernized and addresses the needs of the community can attract residents and visitors and aid in the revitalization of the downtown. CBRM's council and staff are strong proponents for a new or renewed regional library and work is ongoing to explore viable options and to secure funding. 
In order to keep our overall debt and debt service costs at a manageable level, staff recommend that council set aside $3 million specifically toward fund, funding CBRM share of the Sydney Library Project, which would again be leveraged to access funding from other levels of government. And by having these funds set aside for the library, Council will demonstrate to potential funding partners and to the public its commitment to the project as a community and council priority while taking pressure off of future capital budgets. And this initiative supports, again, economic development and population growth and inclusivity. Council has provided approval for a feasibility study on a possible expansion of Center 200 for a multi-sport facility. And while the feasibility study re is reaching its conclusion, the next steps would be to, to secure funding for a detailed design and future construction. This project builds on CBRM's historic success in hosting events that showcase CBRM on the world stage and an expanded building footprint is needed to be successful in future bids for event attraction. So in addition with the growing popularity of court sports and the lack for an accessible and available regional venue, the expansion would provide a facility enabling growth and capacity building for a variety of sports at the regional level. So staff recommend council set aside funds to assist with CBRM's portion of funding for this project. And again, this initiative supports economic development and population growth and inclusivity. COVID has shown us the importance of being outdoors for both mental and physical health. This is also important in attracting newcomers to the area as it enhances the quality of life for CBRM residents. CBRM parks, playgrounds, and community spaces throughout CBRM are now in greater demand and with many in disrepair. It is recommended that council authorize staff to commence a community consultation to identify potential projects throughout CBRM and that funds be leveraged to access funds for newer improved outdoor recreation spaces and equipment. So this initiative is key to strategic vision for population growth and inclusivity and development of harbors. And I have noted, oh, sorry, getting ahead of myself. Yeah, economic development and development of harbors. The HVAC system at City Hall is stretched well beyond its service life and is long overdue for replacement. This has been identified as a need in the past several capital budgets, I think it's been talked about for the last seven since I've been here. However, it has been deferred each year due to lack of, um, due to the size of the capital replacement cost, the lack of cost sharing or funding opportunities or limited, limited borrowing capacity. In addition, the lockup at police headquarters requires a retrofit and there has been ongoing issues with air quality, paint and other equipment that poses various safety risks. It's recommended that funds be, funds be allocated for a one-time investment in a new HVAC system that would provide a more reliable and energy efficient solution for air quality at City Hall and for police lockup upgrades. Funding the capital costs out of top-up funds will now will preserve borrowing capacity for other capital projects and priorities and will also result in immediate operational savings through energy reduction and provide a safer env environment at the lockup facility. And since this issue paper was prepared, a new federal funding program um, COVID-19 Resilience Stream has become available. It's a rebranding of ICIP or a portion of it and is available through the federal government um, for municipalities pursuing ventilation improvement projects, which at a cursory grant, uh, glance could result up to, in up to 80% funding for um, HVAC upgrades at our facilities, which is great news. CBRM and the province of Nova Scotia jointly participate in a J-Class Roads initial paving program. There are approximately 21 roads remaining um, at a length of about a combined length of seven kilometers to complete council's approved phase six list of which CBRM's cost is about a million and a half dollars. The province ultimately approves which roads and maximum cost sharing with CBRM's portion funded out of operations ranging from 130,000 to 300,000 annually. So setting aside, CBRM's portion of J-Class roads will mean that existing budget funds can be eliminated or redirected to other necessary road or sidewalk maintenance or other operating needs. And in the event that the province ramps up J-Class roads projects, CBRM would then be in a position to provide an immediate response and not worry about budget implications as the funds would already be earmarked and set aside for that purpose. As Council is aware, CBRM carries its share of capital costs and short-term borrowing for approximately 18 months prior to converting to long-term debenture. So for example, March 31st, 2021, our capital projects resulted in requiring about $7.5 million, which is carried in our line of credit, um, paying interest only until fall 2022 when we convert it to a long-term debenture. 
This practice was established way back when our debt levels were exceedingly high in order to manage our cash flow, but the Department of Municipal Affairs really frowns upon this practice. It becomes an issue for us every time we apply for a temporary borrowing resolution, um, and it's brought up It's brought up all the time. Every time we are trying to evaluate funding applications with them, request future borrowing resolutions, they bring it up. Using this one-time top-up to pay down the line of credit associated with March 31st, 2021 completed projects will immediately save the municipality $100,000 in short-term interest and approximately $900,000 per year annually in debt service costs over the 10-year amortization period of the loan because we, we would never have to borrow that money. Further, CBRM's overall debt would be immediately reduced by 10% from $70 million to approximately $61 million as of the end of this fiscal year. So in summary, council may want to engage the public to identify other potential priorities that are of utmost importance to residents. While the recommendations presented provide solutions to few of the municipality's many challenges, staff feel it provides a balance of being fiscally prudent, making us more financially sustainable while still advancing the strategic vision of council. And the issue paper has been prepared for discussion purposes. However, staff will be seeking direction from council on the various recommendations during budget workshops in February. I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Madam CFO. Uh, first up on our speakers list, we have Councillor Darren Brookschweiger. Thanks, Mayor, and I, I really appreciate this, uh, Jennifer. You put staff and yourself have put a lot of thought in how we can uh, uh, spend this 15 million. And uh, I don't disagree with, with a whole lot of it. And I guess, Mayor, to you, I appreciate your opening comments on this. Uh, a situation. I've certainly been one to speak to staff about tax uh, decreases and how we can help. And the simple reason for that, Mayor, is as you know, this has been probably a 20-year fight uh, equalization. And that's what we went to the court for was to double our money at that time. And uh, if I just look at the last 10 years, we've probably been shortchanged about 150 million plus. So our $70 million debt would have been, could have been eliminated and a whole lot more money would have been spent on infrastructure and so on. But that didn't happen. And I'm gonna to try to stay clear of the rear view and talk about the future because in our arguments, Mayor, uh, all the time to the government was the fact that our infrastructure was failing we had high tax rates, and uh, those were the arguments in court. And that's why I spoke to staff myself and a few of the counselors about we have to try to give something back to the ratepayers, the people that have been with us uh, throughout the beginning. So I look forward to the uh, budget discussions and uh, where this can be discussed uh, more because really and truly, um, they're calling at one time, but. Uh, we got to hope that this kind of uh, revenue will continue. And, uh, and and at least we know that things are quite busy and, and the review is going on, but there's a whole lot of issues at the provincial level, the same as there is our level, Mayor. And uh, so we'll have to stay on the forefront of continuing to argue, uh, you know, for this continued funding until that new formula is worked out and hopefully for the better. Uh, just on your report, uh, Jennifer, if I could, like you said, most of these things, uh, there's only a couple of them that got a price tag attached to them. And I'm sure that's the idea that there's nothing, none of this to be approved today, that everything will come back on the table during budget, plus other projects throughout the CBRM that are important to everybody as well. I'm sure that's the plan, is it not? Yeah, yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, so like I said, Mayor, there's a lot of these items that are very important. Uh, you know, I, I know we've been talking about HVAC at, at, the, uh, at the building there for a long time, no question about it. Police station, <laughs> it's certainly a, a money pit, it seems, every budget where we have to fix something there, but it's important that it, it is fixed um, for sure. But as I see all the different things that you speak of, the Center 200 expansion, that's certainly one that we can look at budget, which uh, uh, seems to be uh, one that people are talking about. Um, but the other things that we got going on along with this, we've got the district energy that I'm hoping we're gonna get a real good look at and an understanding and a business plan so we can see how that uh, really looks. 
uh, you know, the downtown Sydney is going to start this year, which is a, a wonderful thing to uh, get that up and running. So there's a lot of things on the go here in CBRM. And, uh, but it's important, I think, that all 13 of us have an opportunity to review it all in detail and uh, make sure we can uh, divide things up north, central, and east the best we can. And we know some years it's, uh, it's a little greater in some areas, but it's important that we all uh, are able to show our residents something. And, uh, and with that said, along with, I'm hoping, uh, with the cap there, uh, we're at a 5.4% of an increase this year on the cap. So uh, that's that's revenue that we'll have to talk about that rate. Is the rate gonna be the same? Is it gonna be dropped to match that amount or a different reasonable amount? Because that's a big topic and all counselor and yourself are hearing it there. So it's something that we really have to sit down uh, with and have a real full discussion on. So I thanks for this and uh, thanks Jennifer. Looking forward to the future discussions. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, next, we have Councillor Eldon McDonald. Thanks very much, Madam Mayor. And uh, I too want to thank Jennifer for this issue paper. Uh, there's a lot of stuff uh, in here for us to look at. Uh, I'm on the same page as Councillor Brooks Wagger. I look forward to the budget discussions coming forward. Um, $15 million may seem like a lot of money, but when we look at our infrastructure, infrastructure deficit, uh, it's, it's tens of millions and not in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, so as much as we would all love to be able to decrease our tax rate, um, this is a one-time top up and we don't know what's going to happen after this. Uh, if you reduce your tax rate at this point, uh, it leaves us less money for less services. Uh, we struggle now to provide some of our services the way that it should be provided. Uh, so I would be looking for this money to be able to be put into economic development initiatives that would generate more revenue. The more revenue we can generate, the better opportunity we have to provide better services. And the more growth we have in the economy and the economics of our municipality, then I hope to be able to someday be able to say we can lower that tax rate. Uh, one thing I will ask through you to um, Jennifer or Marie uh, and I just want to, to be sure and clarify that the tax rate uh, that was in when we amalgamated, uh, the base rates that are there, uh, if and when the last tax increases have happened on those base rates, uh, if, if I could ask that. Um, the top of mind for me, Jennifer, I greatly appreciate uh, your comments on the library. I will, through you, Madam Mayor, to Jennifer, uh, this $3 million that, that you're recommending be put aside into a, a high interest account until uh, the project is, is moved forward. Um, council previous uh, to this council uh, was very much committed to, to the library and uh, originally had $4 million put aside with a $3 million contribution from land. Uh, unfortunately, that wasn't able to go forward. The federal government wouldn't recognize the $3 million land cost. Uh, so this is an opportunity for, for this council to uh, move forward with, with, with that commitment from our previous council. Uh, and as you met, mentioned, Jennifer, uh, to give uh, pressure, less pressure onto our, our borrowing capacity, uh, this money is, is allowing that $3 million to come into play, which gets us to that $7 million that we've been struggling to get to, to try to get our library built. So I'm um, hoping during budget discussions, we're able to move forward and, and council will commit to 3 million from this, uh, this particular uh, funding uh, opportunity with the, the government doubling equalization. Um, there, there's just so many different initiatives. Uh, we talked about the HVAC. I know we've been talking about it for years at City Hall. Uh, I was hoping that we would have the uh, the heating, uh, the um, district heating uh, done in the downtown where we might be able to tap into that. But unfortunately, it looks like we're probably going to have to try to move forward to replacing that prior to that uh, facility being built. If it gets built, we're, we're still not there yet. Uh, so I, I see that probably being a budget item that will be discussed this year, and I think probably should be supported. Um, when we look at uh, you know the various different uh, projects and, and opportunities, it's it's hard to choose from them. Uh, but uh, I'm sure our budget discussions will be uh, will be lengthy and very detailed when we get those budget documents. Uh, but one of the other things that we talked about, you mentioned about Jennifer data collection systems. I think there's numerous opportunities with that, but one that stands out for me is that I've heard uh, quite often is the data for our fire services. 
They've been lacking the ability to collect data. Uh, the, the mandatory report very much stressed very highly that that was one of the things we should move forward with. So I, I would support that we look at various data. We talk about being more business friendly. I think if we can have a more modern uh, technology in place to help our business sector and to make people feel that the red tape is not as red as it used to be and it's eliminated, makes business easier. That again leads to more economic development, more econo economic development builds our base that builds our taxes. So that would be the direction I would be looking at going. And again, I wanna thank you and, and everyone else that had any involvement in putting this together. Thank you. Okay, there's a lot there to address. <laughs> Go ahead, Jen. Okay, <laughs> okay. Um, your first uh, question on the base rate, Councilor McDonald. Um, I don't believe the base rate has been increased in at least 10, if not 20 years. I know we have made several adjustments to fire area rates, area rates for provincial taxes, but I believe that the base rate has held firm um, throughout that entire duration uh, of time. Um, the library funding, yes, um, the $3 million recommended is in no way intended to override or supersede the motion previously approved by council with respect to the ceiling of which CBRAM would fund. The 3 million is just a recommendation on, I guess, how we would fund or partially fund our, our portion of that. So the $3 million would take pressure off, off of borrowing if it ends up that CBRM's portion is 7 million, 3 million would come out of these top up funds and we would borrow the balance or, or fund out of, of other reserve or, or whatnot. Um, the HVAC, um, I think it's wonderful news that there actually is a, um, a funding opportunity to be able to cost share that piece of equipment. If district energy were to start tomorrow, um, we're not going to be up and running with that system for at least four years. And I am highly skeptical and I'm sure Director Murphy would back me up in my comment that that system is not going to last us four years until that district energy system is completed. So it, it is going to have to be replaced, whether it's a planned replacement or an emergency replacement. I think it would be prudent to take advantage of the um, potential 80% funding for the replacement of that if it's eligible. Um, and lastly, the data collection fire services, all directors had input into this issue paper, and I would like to take this time actually to thank them all for their input. The data collection side of it was definitely something that was raised by both um, Fire Chief Michael Seth, as well as Chief Police Chief uh, Robert Walsh, um, because both their reports, the fire services or the fire services review, the manager report, as well as the police review um, have identified issue, or issues or requirement to, for data collection. Um, and that will also help aid in future revenue streams that ties into council strategic vision. There are many um, services currently that we provide at no charge that um, no other municipal unit provides free of charge. For example, accident reconstruction reports. Um, insurance companies request them all the time because they're free. And if they had to pay for them, um, it is built into their, their, ins their insurance rate fees for the recovery of that. But um, they request them because they can get them, not because they need them. So that would not only free up, um, improve operating efficiency within our records department, but could be um, a cost recovery opportunity for us as well. And that data collection is certainly going to be integral in, in exploring what areas of um, cost recovery and uh, whatnot that we that that uh, data collection could serve to aid us in that future decision making process on how we recover fees for those types of services. Thank you. Thank you, Madam CFO. Next, we have Councillor Steve Gillespie. Uh, I don't believe I'm next. Uh, I thought maybe uh, James Edwards was next. Oh, sorry about that. I skipped over you, Councillor James Edwards. You're next, then Councillor Steve Gillespie. Thanks, Steve. I, I don't mind uh, waiting in line be after uh, Councillor Gillespie, Mayor, that's fine. Okay, Councillor Gillespie, go ahead. Sorry about that, James. Okay, yeah, no problem. And thanks very much, uh, Mayor, and, and uh, thank you to uh, James Edwards. Uh, unfortunately, I am going to be long. Um, I'm going to pose a couple of uh, remarks and then a couple of questions as well. Um, this $15 million uh, from the provincial government is a welcome amount of money, but let's keep in mind that this is something that was promised by this government 
the previous government has taken upwards of $22 million away from us by freezing the amount they give us and then un not freezing the amount they take back. So uh, $15 million seems like a lot of money, but the reality is uh, if you compare the last 10 or 11 years, uh, you know, we're actually still in debt over this. So when I look at this uh, and I look at the, uh, the stuff that was suggested here, uh, nobody's, I don't think anybody in this uh, uh, council, and, and maybe I'm wrong, but I think the Center 200 project is important. I think the library is important. And I'm what the, the people have called a, a deficit hawk. Um, uh, I, I don't understand why we're still running a $70 million debt uh, and then uh, consistently adding to it every year. If we have an opportunity to pay down our debt, then we should do that because the amount of money that we have not received from previous governments have put us in this situation. So I agree with that. The one thing I don't see here, and I'm not surprised only because I know how we think, um, when the uh, completion of the J-Class roads came up, uh, obviously this is gravel roads, Jennifer, am I correct there? Um, this is specifically the list of J-Class roads from phase six. Yes, but these are J-Class gravel roads. This is yes. a gravel road project. Okay, okay. So what we're getting into here, and, and I've been talking about this, and I know that uh, Councillor Brookswagger and Councillor Elder McDonald are gonna start screaming as soon as I'm done. But we still have the same agreement from 1995 where we don't put any money at all into our paved J-class roads. Uh, and we have, uh, according to the last uh, numbers that were done uh, for our 2020 election, 44.3% of the people in CBRM uh, live in the county. And the county of Cape Breton just keeps getting forgotten about. And uh, the problem is it gets forgotten about when it comes to infrastructure. It doesn't get forgotten about when it comes to tax revenue, because the tax revenue that comes from the county of Cape Breton is uh, somewhere around 45 to 48 percent of our total residential tax. Now, with that, there's an opportunity to look at a provincial uh, uh, partnership. I have been told by several um, uh, former and current managers at DOT that there is just no money left to pave J-class roads and or to repave them. And uh, if there's a chance to do a 50-50 split, maybe we should look at that. Possibly taking a portion of this money, say $3 million, and putting it aside and asking the province to finally come to the table because you know, they, the $2 million that the provincial government puts into J-class roads uh, for gravel roads that's $2 million for the entire province. And we get 150 to 175,000 of it every year. I mean, if they're really serious about J-Class roads, this is an opportunity for us to show that. Um, when it comes to being in debt, and I've always got a real problem with this, is <laughs> operating at $70 million. And we pay for that. That, that comes, like you said, $900,000 a year in debt servicing. Um, we also started this municipality with a $50 million debt. Uh, HRM didn't start with a the debt. Theirs was taken away. So, and we, uh, as a council, sent a letter off a number of years ago to the province. And uh, I was told that, you know, we were just basically told by the province to go back to our seats and put our heads on our desks. Uh, this, is, this is questions that should be asked. So, um, are we even thinking about changes to how we proceed when it comes to J-class roads, repaving and 50-50 splits? Is that something that we're looking at? Because, and keep in mind that the minister told us they are reviewing the service agreement from 1993-94. And I don't know about anybody else on council, but when the provincial government says they're reviewing, that sends a shudder up my spine. Thank you. Thank you, councillor. Not sure who wants to take a, a crack at that. Um, I will offer this though, Councillor Gillespie, there is a provincial roads committee that has been formed. Um, and what I can do is reach out to my um, NSFM colleague, Emily Lutz, who sits on it and see where they stand. And if there's any information we can get back from them, if that's of any help. That'd be great, thanks. CAO. So I'll, I'll take that one. I guess in terms of our staff considering uh, the repaving of J-class roads, 
no, we're not. I guess we've always commented over the years on the J-Class roads and that it is not our responsibility, but we, we do participate in the cost sharing of the original paving. The income tax, the federal, the provincial income tax that you pay, that I pay, that everyone pays, is intended to do those roads. So it's not our responsibility for us to take that on would be huge for us. So as our staff talking about that, no, we're, we, we would not recommend that, I guess. And I understand uh, the councillor's frustration because most of his roads are provincial roads, um, but we would not be recommending that as staff. Thank you, Madam CAO. Uh, Councillor, your time has expired, but if you want to be added back to the list, by all means, just throw your name in the chat there. Uh, the ever patient and kind Councillor James Edwards, you're up next. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Mayor. I appreciate that. And uh, thank you, uh, uh, Jennifer, for your uh, uh, report. Uh, I noticed there's uh, probably seven or eight items on here that you, uh, you and staff uh, whittled the uh, priorities down to, but uh, I'm sure there's uh, seven or eight or uh, 28 uh, more that you uh, considered. So congratulations on this. Uh, um, there are some uh, items on it. Uh, uh, well, most of the items on it, uh, I agree with. There are uh, uh, one or two perhaps that uh, uh, I'm looking forward to uh, budget discussions to uh, uh, discuss more. But uh, when you follow uh, um, the veterans, uh, Brooks Wagger, uh, Eldon McDonald, and Steve Gillespie, there isn't uh, much left for uh, a rookie for me to uh, uh, say, except for um, there are uh, some items on there that uh, I'd like to uh, uh, comment on, but uh, uh, that's probably best left for uh, budget uh, discussions. But uh, it, it is a, a comprehensive look. Uh, I was going to talk about the uh, J-Class roads as well, and uh, uh, Councillor Gillespie has uh, zeroed in on that. I was going to uh, talk about the, uh, uh, the library funding uh, to find out what if, uh, um, as far as the uh, previous amount uh, designated by, uh, or, or amount designated by previous council, I should say, um, and uh, maybe I'll, I'll get you to uh, um, respond to that again. I'm not. I'm still not clear on the on the three plus four, or if it's just three now. Or, um, but uh, otherwise, there are uh, lots of items uh, in the uh, in your paper that are, are certainly um, required. There's no question. There's no uh, argument on that. Um, but there's uh, some other items that. Uh, um, we'd like to uh, talk about uh, more as well. Some uh, would be eliminated as far as a, uh, a municipal uh, um, situation is concerned, but at the same time warrants uh, um, conversation as far as our constituents are concerned. But uh, uh, again, job well done. I'm really enjoying the uh, conversation and uh, um, I'll just uh, leave it at that uh, for now. And uh, thank you again, Jennifer. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, next, we have Councillor Steve Parsons. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And I too, in the essence of Tommy, won't repeat what others have said, but I will take my few minutes to talk about what inevitably I saw is the most wonderful reading I've written in a long time, and that's J-Class Roads and Potential Investment. Wow. 25 years, I'm really gonna take a serious look at this. Uh, I, I'm so glad. Uh, it's one of the opportunities in my district, as you're all completely aware of. Uh, it's an issue on a regular basis. And I, I would suggest in taking a real strong proactive approach because we always wait to see what the province has budgeted and, and their uh, pots of money on what they can do for J-Class Roads. But knowing that we potentially, and I, I would look for the support of all council, if we're serious in taking the 1.4 million, then we need to proactively request a meeting with the province to let them know that's the steps that we've taken. And that our expectation is for all those involved, 25 years is long enough to get these roads paved. I'm sorry, I believe, I see the forest through the trees. I believe in economic development. I think I'm on record as voting for economic development downtown because I do believe in the big picture. But at the end of the day, Councillor Bruce Wagner makes a good point this morning. He said, everybody should get a little bit. Well, this is time for the rural areas and the J-class road to get that little bit. 
last year I asked for a study, an issue paper uh, that was approved by council unanimously to do the economics on J-class roads as it relates to how much does it cost? How many building lots do we have? What can we expect to get for building lots as far as if they're sold and the tax revenue on that? I still hope that's gonna be a part of our budget coming up as pre-information to consider and look at. Uh, I hope it's done, uh, but I'll wait to see. Uh, as far as uh, fiscal responsibility, uh, I certainly believe in paying down long-term debt, absolutely. I think there's a good net savings there for all of us to put money back into economic development if we save on the debt servicing. Uh, there's only one that I, that I need, need some clarity on, and that would be the Center 200. Uh, my memory serves me correctly. I, I know we had some debate last year as, a, as, a, as relates to other sports, including basketball. But I'm told that there's there's now a play of doing the center 200 in terms of a potentially memorial hockey bid. Uh, I'm not aware of those conversations in terms of sitting in on those conversations. I am told there's other meetings going on with MLAs and MPs, which wasn't privy to all of council, but just a district councilor. So I think uh, there's a lot of information to come. Uh, need more details as to what that would look like. Uh, more details as to what it would cost to do the class B estimates, for example, on, and just to do the uh, the overall feasibility on it. So I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to budget, but uh, uh, just to you, Madam Mayor, if you're looking for a provincial volunteer on this committee, feel free to put my name forward on roads. I'll certainly volunteer to sit on any committee that talks about J-class roads or gravel roads, because in the rural districts, not only do we have J-class roads, we got gravel roads, we got private roads, and I'll be honest with you, most of these roads are dirt roads. They're not even gravel roads. There's nothing left on there. They've been graded that many times, there's nothing left. So I think that's a, a bigger conversation on our, our service agreement. And again, service agreement changes with time. We need to get back and time has went on. Things have changed in 25 years and priorities have changed. So with that, I'll leave it, I'll leave it there and I look forward to the budget deliberations for 2022. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Now we can move to Councillor Ken Tracy. Thanks, Mayor. I, uh, my concerns have been answered by a couple of my colleagues, so uh, I can pass on. But having said that, uh, thanks to Jennifer for her recommend recommendations and the staff for, for the work they put into this. But I'm, uh, I'm good. Thank you. Thank you so much. OK, on your second opportunity, Councillor Darren Brooks. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and I can say I'm sure the MLAs are very happy to hear some of the comments about the possibility of us doing more work on provincial roads. I just think that would be great for them because really and truly, many of them haven't delivered a whole lot in rural roads in, in a long time, and I have them as well. Uh, but the truth is, when you're playing around with the amount of revenues we got, I wonder if you, if you want to take that from the areas we're responsible for. And as mentioned, we got 100-year-old sewer lines, and we all got roads that are falling apart within our communities. I can name six of them right now that aren't fit to walk on in District 10, and they're not rural. They're the ones that we are responsible for. Uh, we have put in a bit of money every year uh, with J-class roads, and I always supported that. But remember, J-class roads are provincial roads. We agreed to do that to help. Plus, we're over $500 million a year that per kilometer we pay so much as well in that funding formula. Now, if the funding formula can be rejigged and played with, or 43 cents of the rate in the rural areas, you pay $1.41. 43 cents of that is for education, housing, and corrections. If we can make some changes there to get some of that out, so that we can put into this here, I would agree wholeheartedly, I'm there. But I was at the gas station the other day, $74 to fill the tank. There's a lot of gas tax money there. Not, not on my street, but I'm also subsidizing those rural roads to be fixed. Now I represent rural people, but the truth is with our current amount of money, there's only so much we can do. We have to be after the province and our MLAs, fix the roads. That's most important. And uh, I'm looking forward to this as well in budget uh, conversation because I've got so much that we can talk about here. Thank you. Right on time. Thanks, Councillor. Uh, next, we have Councillor Cyril McDonald. 
Thanks, Madam Mayor. And uh, I'll, I'm, I'll be brief, I guess. Uh, most of my points have been been raised, but uh, I do feel the need to uh, to talk to touch on J class roads. And uh, Councillor Brookswagger says we should all get a little piece of the pie here. Well, that's the only thing in there that impacts my district directly. Uh, I've only got a couple of those roads that are still dirt. And, you know, at the end of the day, this is an agreement with the province that it's 50-50. Uh, do I think the other roads need to, those that are paved need to be attended to? Absolutely. But um, let's focus on the ones that are dirt. And uh, I think, uh, as, you know, Councillor Parsons uh, said it best, they're not gravel anymore. They're, they're dirt. Some of them are right down to, to near nothing. Um, so I, I think that's a, a great recommendation. Uh, Jennifer, I think everything in here uh, I, I agree with, and uh, I certainly uh, was happy to see the J-Class roads brought up. And I think it's uh, it's time that we put that money aside and uh, maybe the province has the same mindset and they'll match our 1.4 million and we'll get them all done and uh, we can move on and then start uh, holding them to task and, and going back and paving some of those other roads. Uh, I wish that I had a town in my district that uh, that I could say there was some nice roads to drive on, but unfortunately, uh, about 95% of mine are provincial, and about 90% of those 95 are in pretty desperate shape. So I'll just leave it at that. But uh, thanks, Jennifer, for these recommendations. Thank you so much. And I have to apologize. I'm so, so sorry, Councillor Gordon McDonald. I skipped over you. Um, if you're able to connect, the floor is yours. Thanks, Mayor. My connection is really unstable. I've missed most of the that went on, on here. Um, so I'll just let it go from there and see what I can get from the rest of this. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, um, if you want, Councillor Gordon McDonald, if you want to type a question into the chat, I can read chat. I mean, I can read it on your behalf for all of council. And, and if there's a way that we can get staff to answer. Um, yeah, maybe it's the time we also incorporate some talk about uh, pressuring all of our colleagues to help us with connectivity across the board. Uh, so yeah, if you want to write your your question in the chat box, I'll, I'll gladly read that out. In the meantime, I will now go to Deputy Mayor Erlene McMullen. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and my apologies for being late. I had another commitment. So I I did try and get caught up a little bit. Unfortunately, I will have to watch the first little bit to see what I missed, but I didn't hear so much touch on outdoor recreation and community spaces. So if I'm repeating yourself, someone just wave your hand and, and let me know and, and I'll shut her down. But um, I, I too agree that a lot of the things listed in here are, are, are great, like the idea to discuss them during budget. Um, they're all very valid, but I also really appreciate the idea of outdoor recreation community spaces. I mean, with this money, would we love to offer tax deduction? I'm sure we would. Like, it, But I have received probably, without exaggerating, maybe a handful of calls and a, a few messages with people expressing their concerns and their priorities. One concern was, yep, we need a new library, but I don't wanna see all our money put on a new library. And yep, we need to develop Sydney, but I don't wanna see all the money put into Sydney. It, it, people are looking for a little bit of a reprieve or a little piece of, you know, they wanna feel that they're, they're receiving it as well. And I understand where we've been so underfunded for so long that it's not a large amount of money but when you look at outdoor recreation and community spaces, now I'm not talking, I, I'm not even going to, it's, I'm not having the same conversation about reaching out to a consultant. That's not what I'm looking for here. But right in this, separate from um, that piece, it talks about reaching out to the community, um, perhaps to, to see what the people want. I can only speak for the north side. I know that we do rely a lot on volunteer groups and things like that to keep festivals going. Like for example, Johnny Miles and Bartown and, and the Frolics and all those good things. COVID has been hard, our volunteers have been hard. I'm just finding it very difficult to repetitively say to people, well, until we have a group, we can't have any kind of things go on so much for the North side. I mean, in, in, in the core of Sydney, which is great, but a lot of people don't have the access to get there. I don't think it's a lot of money to put aside, but I really would like to see that we do make an effort in the upcoming season to make sure that all areas, north, central, 
and east. And when I say north, I'm including Searles District. I'm, in, I'm including Boysdale and, 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 and George's River and all those places, whether whatever it is. But we need to start trying to bring something just not even like we're not talking about these massive concerts or anything like that, but make a conscious effort to make sure that there's activities and things available for our residents in all areas. Yes, I'm north, so I'm a little on that side, but uh, because it has been very dry here for a very long time. We've lost our Canada Day celebrations that used to be funded by the municipality. We like we've lost a lot of things. And yes, because the groups may not necessarily be there, but it's not all cases. So I would like to see that attention be put back because regardless of how we do it, I think I think our residents have had a, a, a few tough years and it would be nice just to 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 spread the wealth in in that kind of a way. And I just wanted to put that out there. Thanks. Thank you, Madam Deputy. Uh, next, we have Councillor Darren O'Quinn. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And uh, thanks, Jennifer, for your presentation as well. Um, I guess where I'm at, I'm more of an optimist than uh, some of my other councillors. I'm hoping that the 15 million this one time top up is, is going to be at least an annual thing. And hopefully when they finish the review, it's going to be even more. But uh, I guess that's, you know, for another day. But uh, I agree with most of Jennifer's uh, recommendations here as well. And, and uh, a few more than others, of course. Um, the open spaces and, and uh, rec, rec places, I'm all aboard with that. The, the library, $3 million. Again, I'll aboard with that. The CBRAM uh, Center 200 expansion. All, all very good points. And of course, like with the HVAC system, if there's 80% funding, we'd be crazy not to after that right now. So basically, I, I'm looking forward to talking to this at budget. A, a lot, lots of stuff to talk about and uh, I'm very excited about it. So thank you guys. And thank you again, Jennifer, for your presentation. Thank you. Uh, Council Parsons on your second opportunity. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Through you to Jennifer. Jennifer, just a quick question. As it relates to the assessment values approximately averaging about 5.2% uh, and looking at our total revenue and taxation, we potentially could be looking at another $5.7 million over and above last year's revenue stream on taxes alone. Would that be correct? Um, Jennifer was kicked out, her connection went down. So um, we'll just defer that question, um, Councillor, for a few minutes, but I know she would have that number for you. Yeah, I just looked at the total revenue and taxes was 150 million. So look at 5%, you're talking another 5.75 million in terms of surplus revenue. I just that, that would be 5% on those I, those properties that are capped. Um, it wouldn't count those that weren't capped. So it, it you would be close for sure. Okay, thank you much. Perfect, Good, great question, Councillor. And what we'll do once uh, the CFO is back in, no matter what we're doing, we'll make sure and get that, that question answered for you. Okay, uh, one question I want to put out to all of Council. So there's been a little bit of conversation about getting some feedback from the community on this. And uh, we do have a wonderful report that's been brought up by, by staff. Um, I'm curious how Council would like to proceed then. Uh, I'm looking for your direction. Would you like to go through a bit of a consultative process? Do we want to do something maybe, um, I guess you could say slightly informal, but through our social media? Um, put some information on our next, I'm not sure if our, our mail outs for tax bills or, or water bills or anything of that nature might line up with our budget um, our budget consultations. But yeah, I, I'd like to open this up for for some comment on how council would like to, to really reach out to the community about this. If not, what I can do is sit down with our community consultation coordinator and perhaps bring something back to you. We can do something through my office. Um, I do, you know, Deputy Mayor Early McMullen said, you know, brought it up, the importance of hearing back from our community about this. So, oh, go ahead, Deputy. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, in previous years, when we were coming up into budget, and I know it wasn't as successful in other areas, and I know COVID's not going to allow us to do it this time, but North, North Sydney in particular, we always had, I shouldn't say always, while well, I've been counselor anyway, and I know fellow councillors have had the opportunity to attend. Councillor Gillespie's been there. But when we have those discussions on the north side, it's, it's usually quite a very, like it's a good discussion. And we all sit around a round table. There might be 20, 30 of us. Um, and, and we do get a lot of direction from that. But I guess with COVID, has any thought been put into 
a manner outside of just an email or because one of the beneficial things I find, and I'll use the CAF as an example, we've been at uh, budget consultation meetings where the public will, well, with certain members might, you know, oh, the CAF and start. And then when they get a little explanation of the background, or it won't even necessarily be the CAF, it could be something for recreation, or it could be something through infrastructure that they may not fully have a full understanding of, that back and forth conversation really, really helps that. And uh, I just, I don't know with COVID how we will get that opportunity. Is there anything being discussed? Yes. And so this week we were actually supposed to be hosting our in-person budget consultations with the community. Uh, prior to Christmas, we made the decision because we were going to be shutting down our building. It's just not the time. And I'm glad the foresight from, from staff came through on that because obviously we can't gather in large numbers right now. Um, there are some ideas being tossed around and actually in the works about creating a really snappy and great information video about how how the budget breakdown works, what our strategic vision is. And then also we had a discussion about this before deputy um, having a survey that's going to go out to the community to talk about basically what we talk about in budget consultations, but also having a space there for folks to give us some feedback. So right now, because of COVID restrictions, we just can't do that in person. Now, if anybody wants to hold a virtual town hall, by all means, there are resources through our communications department, through my office. We can help you with the hosting of a virtual town hall if you'd like, making sure that there are staff members there to also help with uh, minutes from those meetings so we can take those, those minutes back and share them in budget consultations. If that is something any of you council members would like to do, but we have the resources to support you in that. Otherwise, we really... I know, it, you know, we're two years into not being able to get out and speak with people face to face. And it is it, it, it's a remarkable loss to these processes. I, I agree. That's where we're at right now. Um, if Can anybody has any with a request, then if yeah. I, I know we've done this before, um, but I know we're coming close, like it, we're already into mid late January. But the survey and those results so that they come back in time for any budget preliminary, like as soon as we can get them back as council so that yeah. we can use them when we form our own, you know, yeah. I'd like to have the results in hand when we start discussing the budget. I'd like to know what exactly it is the people are there. Yeah. And that concerned. is fully the intent is to have something in your hand to help guide you through those consultations. Perfect. Great. But again, if anybody wants to do um, anything in terms of virtual outreach, Again, it's really tricky to do those in-person meetings right now. We can't even meet in person as a council. Um, just reach out to my office and I'll be sure that you, you have the supports and resources you need. All righty. Well, great conversation, folks. Good discussion on these items. Um, if we're talking about these items so much, I can't wait to have some conversations with folks uh, in the community about it and get some feedback there. We, Because that was for information purposes, we don't need uh, any motions or what have you but we will be bringing all of this back to budget uh, as was stated. That being said, we can now move on to item number nine, bylaws and motions 9.1 B, first reading review of building bylaw. I'm fairly certain, I'm sorry, I can't see right now. Uh, looking for Paul Burke, there you are, Paul. Paul is our manager of building and planning and licensing, licensing laws and I'm gonna hand the virtual screen over to you, sir. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I don't have a PowerPoint presentation, but the uh, first issue before you is on page 114 of your package. Uh, basically, we're looking to make some minor amendments to the building bylaw uh, to catch up with some of the uh, recent amendments the province made to the building code regulations, as well as we're looking to make some tweaks to the permit fees, uh, mainly one adding a new fee to double the permit fee when work starts without the building permit being in place, as well as just tweaking a couple of the other minor charges. Um, so the purpose again of these amendments is basically just to kind of make the bylaw uh, clarify it, um, be more in line with the provincial regulations with respect to non-structural renovations, uh, raising the threshold it's to when a permit is required. Back in 1989, when the province first adopted the Building Code Act, it, it set a minimum value of $5,000 for non-structural work requiring a permit. Um, you know, in, in 2021 dollars, that doesn't buy you very much. Uh, so recently the province made some amendments to its provincial regulations. 
And under these regulations, CBRM and, and other municipalities are allowed to have an, uh, their own bylaw as long as it meets the minimum threshold of the province. So again, we're just trying to, you know, kind of catch up, uh, you know, with, with, you know, current dollars with respect to when a permit's required, when it's, you know, not for the big stuff, not for new construction, not for additions, not for changes of use, but, you know, the everyday of just the work required to maintain your property. So we're looking to, you know, increase that threshold from $5,000 to $10,000. Um, you know, it makes a little more sense as well as looking at um, some provisions with regards to an occupancy permit. Uh, right now you can apply to have an occupancy permit before the job is finished uh, as long as there's nothing unsafe because of the work not complete or being undertaken and so we want to just put a time limit on when that you know remaining work had to be done so that an occupancy permit can be issued in a timely manner and as well uh, behind the there's a draft bylaw that starts on page 116 uh, that, that has all these changes and then behind that is we did a little jurisdictional scan of the permits that are being charged across the province so CBRM is, is, is not the cheapest place to do the work it's, and it's nowhere near the most expensive place. So the, our, uh, our permit fees that we're currently charging along with these uh, requested amendments are, are basically still in the middle of the road with respect to what's being charged across the jurisdiction. And uh, so basically at the, end of the, uh, at the end of the issue paper on page 115, I'm offering kind of two options. One is just to maintain the current billing bylaw However, we are recommending the council give first reading of the new building bylaw found in the attachment and pass a motion to schedule a public hearing to consider repealing the existing bylaw and replacing it with the new bylaw as found in attachment A. And if there's any questions, any of this, I'd be more than willing to take those questions. Thank you so much, Paul. Uh, Councillor Steve Gillespie, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor McDougall, and uh, thanks very much, Paul, for the presentation, and uh, I completely agree with what you're doing here. A uh, question I have is uh, is on page 114 and in that discussion area where we're looking at a fine, which is basically just doubling the permit fee. Although that sounds big, the reality is that's really not a lot of money, is it? Not for most of them. Uh, you know, our permit fees, you know, you know, can range from, you know, 40 or $50 for a minor renovation right now up to, you know, thousands of dollars for a big commercial project. Most of the stuff that we're encountering that started without a permit are, you know, more than minor types, you know, storage garages being built, you know, there, that's a $70 permit fee that would double it to 140. We also have other means of enforcement. You know, we can lay summary offense tickets that, you know, they chart, they start at $679. So that's a fairly big penalty. And that's, you know, mostly for, you know, situations where there's non-compliance or we have a repeat offender that just doesn't seem to get it, that there's a law that we're all expected to follow and there's regulations and, you know, building code and inspections and bylaws are all about public safety. Um, we are, empowered and, and, and required by the province to, you know, have billing inspectors and have billing permits and have inspections at various mm -hmm. stages of the work. So, um, yeah, they're not a lot of money for the most part. Okay. Yeah. And it, that's just part of it for me. I mean, when we're looking at the uh, illegal dumping issue, we, we uh, you know, we made some big uh, inroads there by increasing the fines and, uh, you know, just, you know, make discouraging people from from doing this kind of thing. And this is what I'd like to see as well. Uh, you know, but of course, you know, this is your department and I'm not going to I'm not going to force my opinion on it. I just always find that, uh, you know, when you when somebody is going to do something like that, like your indication is that there are people that do it on a regular basis or there, you know, and a summary fine is uh, is possible as well. Uh, I just like the fact that uh, if there's an opportunity for us to show that we're a little getting a little sick and tired of it and we're willing to put a dollar figure on it. So um, I appreciate the fact that you're bringing this forward and I know there are other changes that need to be made and I, I fully support it. So thank you. So I know um, there are two options being put forward here. Um, from the report in your agenda. I'll read them again, but there will be a, a requirement of a motion from council to go in either direction. Mayor McDougall, my apologies. I was going to make that motion. Okay, go ahead. Okay. I, I would like to uh, make motion put on the floor that uh, we take recommendation two 
Uh, council give the first reading to the new building and bylaw found in attachment A and pass a motion to schedule a public hearing to consider repealing bylaw uh, S4 building bylaw and replace it with the new building bylaw found in attachment A. I'll stick in that, Madam Mayor. Sugar, sorry about that. Moved by Councillor Steve Gillespie, seconded by Councillor Steve Parsons, that council move forward with option two. Any discussion on that motion, council? Question. Question has been called. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Contrary nay. Motion is carried. Uh, thank you kindly, Paul, for that. And now we are able to move to item number 10, protective services issue. Item 10. Mayor, Mc, Mayor McDougal, my apologies. Uh, I, I'm just noticing something here that uh, Gordon McDonald, who is having some issues, has populated a question in the in the chat. Is that correct or am I not seeing that right? Oh, sorry. I'm trying to keep track of too many lists. My apologies, folks. Um, I did mention to Council Gordon McDonald, like you said, who is having some um, technical connectivity issues. Uh, people are afraid of applying for a permit because of the link to their taxes and, and the potential for their taxes to increase. So is it safer for them to try? To, so it is safer for them to try to circumvent the permit. So that's a comment that was made regarding the conversation. Yes. Sorry. Now that's on the record there. Thank you for noticing that, Council Glasby. Okay, we will now move to item 10, protective services issue, item 10.1, council authorization to commence legal action. Uh, again, over to you, Paul. Thank you, Madam Mayor and Council. And further to the building bylaw where we are in noticing an increase in work without permits, you know, we do issue work order or orders under the building code act to get compliance. Um, and we do work with these individuals to try to get them on track wherever possible. Um, and, but typically, you know, once we issue orders and get involved, we, we generally get compliance most times. However, there have been situations where people refuse to comply with the order. Uh, and so there's no, there's no recourse other than to take it to the next step. And that's where we are here today. Um, starting on page 133 is a very short memo, which gives you a little bit of a background and is identifying four properties that I'm seeking council's authorization to take legal action against in the Supreme Court of Nova Scotia. Uh, this is different than the usual process where I'm here with the owner and we're going to have a little chat uh, before an order is made and give that op the opportunity to that person to respond. In this particular case, I'm just looking for authorization to take it the next step, which will be court. And it's at that process where we'll be you know, notifying the affected owners and they'll be given an opportunity to make their appeal to the Supreme Court of Nova Scotia before the judge considers any order. Uh, this process is dictated in the Building Code Act and regulations. So again, it's a little bit different than, you know, the, the process is required under the CBRM land use. It's a little bit different than the process required under the Municipal Government Act for danger, dealing with dangers on site your premises. So because we've issued orders and we've had conversations with these four, these four property owners, um, there is no path forward for these projects. They've either gone to council and been rejected or there is, there is no way to move it forward under the current regulations. Um, they've been issued orders to comply, you know, to remove these structures or take some action. They've refused to do that. Um, so the next step is, is I need to take them to the Supreme Court of Nova Scotia and hopefully seek an order to remedy the situations. So in these particular cases, the order to remedy that I'm gonna be seeking for is the removal of these structures that either were built without a permit, located without a permit, or renovated and change the use without a permit and to which we cannot issue a permit for at this time. Um, so the four properties I'm seeking an order against are listed on page 134. Um, the first is 81 York Street in Sydney, Nova Scotia. This was a personal accessory building that was constructed with a permit years ago. They applied for a permit to do some work to convert it and change the use of it, which was denied. We did meet with the owner or did speak to the owner over the phone and exchanged several emails as to the situation. Um, there's no compliance or objecting to having to do anything with their building now that they've got it 
built and converted. And uh, so I'm seeking an order or seeking permission to go to the courts to get an order to remove this structure. Uh, 21 and 23 McLeod Street in South Bar is a, a situation that was brought to council looking for permission to seek a zoning amendment and they were turned down, uh, resulting in that we now have an illegally built structure that we cannot legitimize through a permit and inspections. Uh, we have 50 Charlotte Street, which is basically in the North End Harris District, where a property owner located a small accessory building on the front yard of his property, contrary to the North End Heritage land use bylaw. Uh, has been quite offensive to his neighbors. We get a lot of complaints about it. We spoke to him on numerous occasions and have issued him an order to remove it, and he refuses to. And the fourth property is on 41 Third Street in Glace Bay. Uh, this is the new Aberdeen revitalization area where we're working with that group to revitalize these empty residential lots and, and you know, market them to the people so they can build nice, affordable housing. And uh, we have an applicant that basically you know, purchased one of these properties under false pretenses, has built uh, some buildings and some additions contrary to not having permits, contrary to discussions we've had with them. And again, there's no recourse, legal recourse for these people to be, be able to legitimize these structures to inspections and permits. So I am seeking a, a separate order for each one of these properties to commence legal action. Uh, if there's any questions before you want to consider an order or making the motion, I'm, I'm certainly open to any questions you may have. Thank you, Paul. Okay, I'm going to head over to the speakers list now. So first up, we have Councillor James Edwards. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you, Paul, for your report, and, uh, and thank you for the opportunity to ask questions before uh, uh, voting on that. And what I, my question is, uh, at, at the risk of... Uh, not having digested the uh, uh, building uh, bylaws. Uh, um, how did we get here? What's the chronology of events that have to take place to get here to the legal action? Like, is there uh, letter, personal visits, letters sent out, legal action uh, uh, letters, um, uh, registered mail, uh, uh, field calls and the like. Can you just give me a quick uh, Cole's notes on uh, uh, how we got uh, here today, Paul, please? Absolutely. Thank you for the chance to clarify the process. Um, each one of them is a little bit differently. Uh, but ultimately what happens is once we become aware of a situation, we contact the property owner. Um, in these cases where the billing code matters, we uh, fix an official order to the, the offending structure. So a billing inspector will take the complaint, will go out, you know, verify that there's a problem. And it usually starts with the posting of a stop work order on the building. Um, where some of these structures were already stopped, uh, the order that was posted was called an order to comply. Um, you know, that starts the communication process with the property owner, or the builder, or the developer, whatever the case may be. We've had conversations with all of these people. Uh, they've either been on the phone um, and or through email or, and or they've come into the office to, you know, to talk about solutions. Um, you know, staff have gone through the various bylaws to see if there is a way forward. Um, in these particular cases, there isn't. Um, further concerning is it's very difficult for municipalities to issue permits after the fact. Uh, we assume a whole lot of risk if we're approving something that wasn't properly inspected at its stages. Um, so, you know, even the simplest matters that, you know, really, you know, what's the difference? I didn't get a permit. I'm applying for a permit. Give me now. Well, I mean, if the work gets covered without the required inspections under the Building Code Act and, and there's a problem down the road, it's it's not Paul Burge or his billing officials that are being held to task, it's the municipality. You know, the municipality is required to administer and enforce the Billing Code Act under, under the Act itself. So there are conversations, we've had conversations with all four of the affected property owners in this case. Um, you know, some of them, they have an understanding of the issue and I think they were just hoping we'd go away. Um, some of them were quite, um, how should I say, um, aggressive, belligerent. Uh, belligerent in their interpretation and what they were and weren't going to do with us. And, you know, we maintain our professionals and composure and, you know, we deal with things through written order. So they're all aware of the situation. They're all aware that they're in contravention of the bylaws. And so that's, you know, so we're not, you know, we're not 
doing this in secrets, uh, secrecy of anybody. It's been full transparency and and we've given them time to, you know, consider their options and to move forward and, and they've chosen not to. So it, we do have a time frame under the act that we have to act, um, you know, so we keep all that in mind. And that's why we're here today with these four. There are a number of others um, that we may be coming in, in future because we are seeing more and more of this. The building codes and acts and regulations are more and more complicated every day. Um, we see those lovely lawyers on the news every night when we turn on the news. Um, you know, have you been wronged, harmed by the negligence of others? Well, you know, it's a very litigious and, and yeah, fraud with liability building code stuff. So it's very important that we take a stand and, you know, do what we have to do under the Building Code Act and regulations, and that's to get these orders and get these offending structures dealt with. And in your uh, progression, the uh, legal warning has been uh, given and there'd be, a, like, for instance, a 30-day timeline. You have to uh, do this within 30 days. Otherwise, we will be uh, taking uh, legal action against you and that warning has been given and expired. Yes, those orders have been given and have expired. Yeah. So really, and they do get, they will, you know, they will be given notice if, you know, if council approves the legal action. Part of that process is they will get summoned to court and they will have the opportunity to provide their information to the judge, just like they would if it was a council decision. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, next, we have Councillor Steve Parsons. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Through you to Paul. Paul, thanks for your report. Uh, I just said more of a question, not to dabble in the daily operations, more process than anything for me. Need to understand the process and you know ultimately of course we're following exactly what our processes are as it relates to 81 york street because i've had some inquiries on that in this particular property yes. uh, and i'm not going to go into the history of when they apparently applied for a permit i guess for me is if they tie into water and sewer of cbrm of course public works got to go out and tie them in i would right. assume yes that being the case if one department is going out tying in someone who's going to connect to our CBRM infrastructure, I would assume that a permit would have been granted for them to in order to, for them to hook up. And if that's the case, if they didn't have a permit, why would we even hook them up if they don't have a proper permit upon inspection that we're hooking up something that we're gonna charge a fee for? And we have been on this property, by the way, they've been paying their, paying their bills for the last two years. And now, now an order goes out to tear down. I'm thinking if we've got a structure that's, somewhat sound i'm sure it had to be inspected some way somewhere why would just automatically the order be tear it down and i know you're trying to recuperate you know uh, uh, what they owe what no not what they owe because i think they're up to date on their bills they tell me so i'm guessing for me it's if you're hooking into our infrastructure that should require a permit how can we go about two years later and put a condemn on it and tear it down if they've been paying their bills of which they should have had a permit why didn't somebody follow up and make sure they had the appropriate permit before we turn on our sewer and turn on our water? Thank you. Okay, it's it's not uncommon and it is permitted to have a, an accessory building in your in your building and to you know get a permit and get water in there for two plumbing fixtures. Um, that's kind of the first time we heard from this property owner. Um, they applied for a permit um, to do that. Um, in the discussion that we had with them, they told them what was what, what they wanted to do with the property and therefore the permit was denied. Um, CBRM Public Works are very, they do not hook or run water and sewer to a vacant lot. Um, a permit is required. This In, in this particular case, there was, it, there was a permit for the, the building of the garage originally. Uh, so the garage stood as a garage for a number of years before the owners took it upon themselves to make these renovations. They applied for a permit, were denied. Um, they still chose to move forward with making those renovations, knowing they didn't have a permit. Uh, because it was an existing structure and because it's not uncommon for public works to be dealing with water and sewer connections to accessory buildings, it didn't raise a flag with them. It did raise a flag with us once we had conversations with the owner. That's what their intentions were. Uh, so we denied the permit. They did the work. Uh, we didn't become aware that they did the work until we started receiving complaints from the neighbors. So when we went down and, you know, further inquired as to what it's when we discovered they had actually not only didn't 
went above and beyond the work they were denied for, which was just to install two plumbing fixtures in the building. They actually installed, turned the building into a dwelling unit and installed four plumbing fixtures, a complete bathroom group and a kitchen and were illegally occupying the building as a dwelling unit. So, you know, they had every, op they attempted to get a permit in this particular case, were denied and still chose to go out to work. And then we flagged them and had further discussion with them. And again, they were refusing to comply with the order. They're making a great deal of noise about the process. Um, we're being the ones who are unfair. Yes. Yeah. If I could stop just yeah. for one second, um, the amount of detail being shared right now in terms of the individual properties, that wasn't in this report. And my, my worry is that when we prepare for appeals committees, what have you, there are oftentimes we need to go in camera to have discussions on the details of these various properties or, you know, I don't, and I'll refer to the clerk and the solicitor, is this content beyond the scope of what we should be discussing right now? Um, and like I said, I, I, I just want to get some advice from the solicitor, if, if I could, please. Uh, not so far. Um, so far, I think we're, we're okay to be dealing with it in public. Um, the orders are going, the requested order to go to court has to be done in public. So um, I think if it crosses the line, we can, we can cross that bridge if we come to it, but so far we're, we're okay. Okay. My, and again, a couple of council members and myself included have, are seeing, there are, there are addresses associated with this conversation and I, we often will have conversations about, you know, the demolition orders and what have you, but this conversation for me personally, uh, I, I feel like we're going a little bit too deep into personal details. Okay, Paul, um, you can continue on. However, I would advise. Uh, actually, Madam Mayor, oh. if, if, if I could if add. I Paul, oh. I don't need to know all the Oh, we've got some glitches. I know that the solicitor wanted to add a little piece there, Council Parsons, if you don't mind. Uh, well, I would add that if Council wishes to go in camera to get further advice on the, the legal process, that is allowable under legal advice. So if, mm -hmm. if, if Council feels they need some advice on some information that can't be shared right now, it is permissible to go in camera to have a, a deeper discussion. Very helpful, thank you, Mr. Solicitor. Um, we can continue with this conversation. Uh, I'm gonna add myself to the, to the list to speak to because I have a thought to share with council, but I, do, I want to respect the speakers list. So um, we'll, I'll add another little bit of time there, Council Persons, go ahead. Do I have a little bit of time left, Madam Mayor? Yeah, I'll, I'll okay. throw a couple more minutes your uh, way. Paul, yeah. th thank you, Pat. Thanks, Paul. Uh, Paul, I guess for me is if I'm expected to make a decision on voting, taking legal action, then I need to be comfortable with our processes. In your own words, you had indicated that sometimes it happens that public works goes and hooks people up. I don't understand that from a permitting standpoint. If I'm to hook up a water and sewer to a garage or to a home or an accessory dwelling on my property, the fact that I'm hooking into our infrastructure would dictate a permitting, a permit. If that permit didn't go, and we hooked them up and then they came back for a permit that we denied, then we preferably we put the cart before the horse, I would think. And sometimes, yes, it may happen that one department may not communicate with the other, but when it comes to, we learn from these, right? If we're gonna learn from this, of course, and take legal action, then we, un we need to put our process in place that we don't find ourselves in this predicament anymore. So why are we hooking people up for services that we're going to charge them, which we do, uh, and then deny them a permit? I, I don't understand that. Thank you. I guess just to keep it at a policy level, I can assure you that I'm following the process that I'm required to follow. Um, how they got hooked up from Public Works, I guess I can leave that for Public Works to answer. But the process of hooking up them to Public Works does not does not give them the right to you know proceed without the required permits under the Billing Code Act. So what I'm asking for is Absolutely. the opportunity to take them to court, and they can they can they can lay out their their side of the story to the judge and let the judge decide on the rules of law and who followed the proper processes. But I can assure you the reason why we're here today is because 
I am following the proper processes and procedures as outlined under the Building Code Act, the Building Code Regulations, and our own building bylaw. Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks, folks. Uh, next, we have Councillor Lauren Green. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you, Paul, for the explanation that you gave uh, Councillor Edwards, because that was one of my uh, uh, inquiries in, in regards to where we're at now. Um, I'm going to speak specifically about 21 and 23 um, McLeod Street and Soap Bar. I was inducted to this council at the very first meeting this issue came up. Um, so it was, um, I guess, um, baptismal by fire, I guess, for me at that night. Um, and I had questions that, that evening about uh, this particular property uh, because I had conversations with the homeowner and they indicated to me that they had the they had call they had followed the proper steps and uh, so I'm quite surprised to see that here now um, because I had discussions with the owner like I say they are they're not in the area they're actually in Ontario but I had several conversations with them and they've been trying to work with us um, because their understanding is they did everything according to according to our uh, regulations they had an inspector down before they did things they need to do certain things so I guess I'm questioning why that is here now. If we haven't followed up off after that off that council meeting to have the continued conversations with this particular homeowner uh, for this property, um, that's the first question. And secondly, is um, as Councillor Parsons said, you know, I, I and I understand, you know, the procedures. One one may be not associated with the other, but this here particular one, um, these individuals have indicated to me that they had inspectors down before they in fact followed through and, and did what they um, did on their property. So I'm a little confused as to why we're looking to take legal steps um, because this individual sounded like somebody who wanted to work with the municipality to do things right. So um, can you explain how it got to this point? Absolutely. Well, as you recall from that meeting uh, that you attended, that was, a, that was a started with a motion or a staff report wondering if council wanted to consider opening up zoning to allow them to do what they've already done and it was council that turned that request down so at that point they'd already done what they you know did without the required permits there was some discussions with the billing official but at no time did they ever make an application or were they ever given a permit and it wasn't wasn't until you know, we looked into the situation and by the time it got to council where you rejected their opportunity to open up zoning and have it looked at as an amendment, everything was already done without permits. So I can assure you again, we've never approved what they did there on this third unit. Um, there's no permit issued for it. Um, and furthermore, we did talk to them about their, their first step would be to go to council and get a zone amendment. and they tried that and council turned them down. So that's why I say at this particular point, there is no path forward for this project because council has already rejected their application for zoning, which at least would have you know, opened it up for a public hearing to determine whether that property would have been subject to the provisions to allow a third dwelling unit on it. So the, the shorter answer is no, they were never given any blessing to do what they did. Uh, they were counseled to say, well, the first step is to, you know, see if council is willing to entertain a zoning request. And it was council and yourself and your colleagues at, and I believe it was your first council. So you're right. It was trial by fire. And the, the decision, the United States decision to council that night was to deny their request. So uh, this is the fallout. They were advised what they had to do, which was to get rid of that third unit. Uh, they asked for some time to deal with the tenant who had already moved into this unit to get rid of them. And, to date, they haven't taken any action to try to make the situation better. So, you know, we're going to the next logical step, which is to seek uh, your your approval to take them to court to get a court order to remove the structure. It's been built without a permit. It's been occupied without an occupancy permit. There's people living in this unit, and we can't say that it's safe for them to be in there because we've never issued a permit or conducted an inspection on the property. So we're looking for... Sorry, Councillor, that's your time, but I can add you on to a second, a second opportunity if you like. Please. Okay, Councillor Eldon McDonald. Thanks very much, Madam Mayor, and through you to Paul. Uh, Paul, a couple of these um, issues are, are within my district and uh, the 81 York Street one is, is something that uh, I struggle with. Um, I, I guess I'll ask, you mentioned that, that they had applied for a permit denied. So, 
my understanding is the owners of this property purchased it a couple of years ago. So was this was this accessory building developed into a unit by the previous owners or the current owners? I believe the current owners, the current owners are the ones that applied for the permit to put the two plumbing fixtures in it, but they did purchase the property with a legal accessory building on it that the previous owners had applied for a permit, received the permit inspections and built. Um, so it is the current owners that did apply for a permit to make some changes to it, uh, were denied it and proceeded to do the work without the permit. Okay, so that was, that was the, that's the current owners. Um, I guess I, I, I look at this and, and the facility itself that they have there is it's, it's quite a beautiful um, job done on the, on the building. Um, what it comes back to for me is the liability issue and Dimitri could, could jump in and answer, answer this uh, through you, Madam Mayor, uh, in regards to the liability. Uh, if we're liable for if something happens in that property and there was a fatal accident there, uh, is there repercussions that could come back on the, on the taxpayers? That's a, a huge issue for me. Um, I also look at the CBRM forward document. We are looking at the possibility of, of amending uh, our planning strategy and, and accessory buildings may or may not be part of that strategy. Uh, but to be so close, the, the CBRM forward document should hopefully be done, completed by the end of this year uh, to see that facility tore down. Uh, and then 10 months later, uh, council potentially approve building such as this to be used for the purpose of providing uh, housing. Uh, and, and we all know we need as much uh, housing, good quality housing as we can get. So it, it, is it possible that the owners have developed it into a, a, a residential unit, um, that it could go back to not being a residential unit, that it not be tore down? Or you, is the ultimate decision that if you go to court, that the decision from the courts is asking them to remove it and tear it down? Or why could they not, uh, I guess, take out the amenities that made it into an apartment and allow the structure to stand, but it may be used as a garage or a workshop or whatever, as opposed to having it comp completely demolished. The other thing is, you know, if, if steps were taken to uh, use or decommission it as, as a residential unit uh, and uh, the CBRM forward document was completed, uh, council made a decision to amend the strategy and accessory buildings would be allowed to be to be done. Could they not then apply for a permit and then look at what was done and have what was done inspected and looked at after the fact if the strategy was changed? Is that potential opportunity for the homeowner at that point if, if we didn't destroy it? I'm wondering why we have to remove it. Throw you, Madam Mayor, to Paul, if I could. Okay, so in part of the discussions I had with the owners was, you know, I did give them the option to bring it back to a garage, um, but I did indicate as per the Building Code Act, if they didn't, I had no choice but to seek an order for removal of the offending structure. Um, so they've been giving the opportunity to bring it back to a garage. Uh, they refused to. Um, they've sent a number of emails and copied some people. I've seen them. They're I'm a little hesitant to say any further about that, but I can assure you again that, you know, we've been more than fair with them. Uh, they have chosen not to do what has to be done. And under the Building Code Act and regulations, my only option at this point is to seek an order to remove this structure. Um, to leave it in standing on whether the regulation may or may not change, we have no idea what the new regulations may say. They may allow it or may not, but in the meantime, every day that that building is there and there's people in it, you know, you as a municipality who are required under the act to administer and enforce the regulations are the one that are at risk should something happen in there. If there's a fire in that unit tonight and people get hurt, you know, people are going to be looking to sue somebody. That's just the reality of the environment that we work in as municipal officials. Um, we cannot go and issue an inspection the work that's been covered without it being inspected before it was covered. Um, you know, so there's a whole host of issues. So, I mean, I'm sure if Dimitri wants to weigh in or if you want to seek a legal opinion from Dimitri, the, you know, courts and Can Lee and previous judgments have always been very extreme against the municipality. Even when we try to do things right, you know, there's the building code and 
having work done and permits issued before it starts and having work done at various stages until you get to a final inspection are all in place and designed to make sure everybody's responsible and aware of what the requirements are so that when a building gets built and occupied, people know it's been built right. Well, at this point, we don't even know if it's been built right. We know it's illegally built. You know, they built without permits. Um, there's people in that building and should something happen in the meantime, if we're not seen to be dealing with this situation to the courts, we could be held responsible, yes. Okay, um, and, I, and I would case, like- sorry, Eldon, that's your time. You can- yeah, I would like I would like I would like Dimitri to respond though. I did ask Dimitri to respond on, on whether we're liable. The primary liability would be on the person who built without the the permit. Um, that being said, court cases they always try to drag the municipality in, so it would be likely that we would be have to at least fight the case with respect to liability on behalf of the municipality. I'm not suggesting that we we do indeed have liability in the situation, but um, we more than likely would be dragged into any any case. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, Councillor Darren O'Quinn. Thanks, Madam Mayor. Um, I'm kind of struggling with the 81 York Street one as well. I, I, I've uh, spoken to the owner of this property numerous times as well. And uh, I, I guess I, I'm kind of at the same position as Councillor Parsons, where like they've been paying their bills for two years. Uh, I mean, we gave them a permit, or they must have some kind of permit to get the work done then. And, and now to go and like tear, tear down the building. The, the owner has, has indicated to me that they're willing to have the building inspected. I, I mean, uh, I, I don't really see the, nece the necessity of, of uh, tearing this building down. I, I just don't. Uh, um, I, I don't know. I think at the very least, maybe this should be postponed until we, we get some better communication between uh, uh, Paul Bird and, and the owner, and maybe they could like try to iron things out. I mean, they seem to be willing to work with the CBRM, and uh, and I think we should be willing to work with them as well. So maybe we could just maybe, maybe like postpone this, and maybe have some better communication between um, Paul Bird's the office and the, and the homeowners. That's what I'm suggesting. Thank you, Councillor. Is that all for your questions and comments? It is. Is, is that a possibility that this could be delayed? Like, uh, I mean, until there's a better communication between the homeowner in question and and, uh, and Mr. Bird, because she has indicated to me that she's had trouble getting a hold of him, and uh, and just some miscommunication there somewhere. I just like to see them on the same page, maybe, and you know, and uh, maybe this can be ironed out with going to court. They do go to court. It's a big expense on the homeowner as well. I mean, they have to get a lawyer. Like we're putting an undue expense on. Uh, and a good a good CBRM resident. I mean, like the two two tech companies in in this property alone, and uh, we're doing good things. I mean, we should try to help these people. And, and uh, I mean, maybe we can work something out without going to court. That's all I'm trying to. Is that possible? I guess. Yeah. So I was going to ask a question um, to staff for advice, be the CAO, clerk, um, solicitor. This and Paul. Correct me if I'm wrong, but this is the first time council has ever undergone this type of procedure. Am I right? It's the first time they've undergone since I've been here. I can confirm that. Um, okay. but I can also confirm to Darren's comments that there's been plenty of dialogue back and forth between me and the owners. So I know there's some, again, there's some emails floating around that seem to be contrary to that. But I can assure you there's been lots of dialogue with the owner. Appreciate that. So my question this to is uh, Mr. Oh. Mayor. Um, um, this is not the first time we've undertaken the Supreme Court actions with respect to properties. Okay. Um, maybe not in this particular permit, but like we've we've have in the past taken property owners to Supreme Court for a number of issues. Um, so my thought is, we obviously need to take a look at this process. Um, rules are in place for a reason. However, um, we need to have a good understanding of what we can and cannot do. And for council to have that opportunity to speak with our legal staff, to get advice on how to carry forward with these processes, I feel that is a very important option at this point. Um, it, it's very uncomfortable talking about people's personal situations in such a public realm like this. I know when we go through appeals, there's a reason that we don't we don't broadcast every detail to the public because there's a respect of the homeowners and the details of those files. And so if it is agreed, 
uh, by council members, and, and by all means, I still want to go through the speakers list, we can postpone this process and have an opportunity to speak with our legal counsel, uh, take a jurisdictional kind of look at what is being done in other municipalities as well when it comes to these processes and have a conversation about having these types of processes the same way we have our appeals. Um, I don't know how council feels about that. I know postponing decisions is not what we're here for. However, getting educated before we make an, a decision is also very helpful. So I'll put that out there. We don't have to make a decision in this moment. There's a speaker's list, but um, I'll, I'll come back to this at the end of the discussion. Uh, next, we have Councillor Gordon McDonald. Thanks, Madam Mayor. Um, I kind of switched over to my phone, uh, so I hear a little bit more. Um, I, I think Councillor Elder McDonald kind of asked my question about the liabilities, he, liabilities uh, that the CBRM would, would incur. Uh, should the property owner continue or something happen on that property? So, um, so, so my question, I guess, to, you, to through you to Paul would be: um, so, Paul, let's, if if this were to pass either today or in a delayed uh, situation, but um, so what steps would you take uh, regarding the property owners to comply with it? And should it have to go to a court situation, what steps would uh, your department take? to follow the court orders that were, would be presented by the solicitor or by the, the judge, I guess. Thanks. Thank you for the question. Again, like I say, I'm, I'm here just to request council's approval to take them to court. They will, if we get them to court, they'll be properly served. I'll be providing disclosure, my file that supports the legal action we're taking. They will be given an opportunity to provide the information, you know, contrary to the order to fight the order, you know, they'll, I'm sure they'll have some information and they'll probably provide some testimony as I will and my staff will, and the courts will decide based on law. Um, they'll take the emotion out of it. They'll take the economic development opportunities, the affordable housing out and they'll deal with the issue based on law. Um, and, you know, that's what I'm recommending. This is, these are tough issues. These aren't derelict buildings. Um, and, you know, they have some valid points, but at the end of the day, council is required by the province under the Billing Code Act to enforce, administer and enforce the Billing Code Act. Yeah, what's I follow, that? You know, what's I follow that? procedures and, you know, the next step in that process to give them fair process is to get them in a court of law. And then the judge would ultimately make that decision. Yeah, so I, so, so I guess my point is, so another... We, we have in, uh, other areas in the CBRM where they can go to the Supreme Court and other times judges have made decisions, but the CBRM doesn't uh, follow up on the decision of the court. So is, would your intent be to follow up with the decisions of the court? I always go with counsel's decision, whether it's what I'm recommending or contrary, and I would always go with what the court decided, whether it's what I'm recommending or contrary. So this department, we follow the process and we carry out our directions, be it directions of council, be it directions of senior management, or be it directions of the court. Uh, you know, if there's a legal, if there's something that has to be done, and these are tough decisions and tough actions to take sometimes, but we will always follow the direction we're given through council, through the courts, and to our director and senior administration. Thanks, Paul. And just one more question. Are all these uh, buildings um, have people living in and one more, I'm sorry, two questions. And was there a water meter put on 81 York Street? Thanks, and that'll be the end of my questions. I'm not sure how, how Public Works serviced it. Um, the first two, 81 York Street and 2123 McLeod Street are occupied dwellings. 50 Charlotte Street is just a storage building and 41 Third Street appears to be a business operating contrary to the land use bylaw in accordance with a couple of other deficiencies on that file but they're not occupied as dwelling units. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Mayor, if I could just add, I just wanna follow up on some of the comments of the councillor. We would always abide by a court order. Um, we've never contravened an order of the court. Once we receive a court order, we would either just decide whether it's appealable or we abide by it. We never just flagrantly ignore a, an order of the court. Thanks, Dimitri. Okay, thank you, Councillor. 
Uh, next, we have Councillor Darren Brookswag. Uh, thanks, Mayor. And, uh, you know, the job isn't always easy. Uh, these jobs, there's sometimes there's real tough choices and decisions that got to be made. And, uh, you know, we give staff the orders to do their job. And, uh, and in this case, we've got provincial legislation with property that's, uh, that we always seem to be the people in charge of, including inspections that the province puts out the rules and we got to pay the cost to have all the inspections done and we do it. And uh, it's not easy to hear of a, a person's property. Uh, I've got something similar on the next property, but, uh, but at the same time, um, you know, water and sewer lines, by the way, to my knowledge and Wayne, I don't know if Wayne's got his ears on right now or he's offline, but um, anybody can get a water line and a sewer line installed to an accessory building, a uh, garage, for example, and uh, without a permit, uh, that's just something you can do. I mean, you got to have your permit for the garage, but you can order that, number one. So um, it doesn't mean that you can turn it into something different than that, you know, without getting a permit. So. Uh, I think that's important to point out as well. Um, not easy. I mean, we could all sit here and we're doing our best to, you know, feel sorry. And I call it sucking and blowing. But at the same time, we do have uh, regulations. And uh, when the taxpayer stands in a, in a liable position, uh, that's where we have to be as counselors. Unfortunately, that's that's the long and short of it. I've been around for a few of these uh, issues before. And, uh, you know, uh, Paul is doing his best. We've got a lot of activity going on. Somebody mentioned it though, because of our tax rate, it's more and more. That could be the case, but it still doesn't make it right. There's a lot of these garages going up everywhere. And, uh, you know, we need that assessment uh, on top of making sure these properties and accessory buildings are built to a, a standard that meets the codes. Uh, that's the long and the short of it. I, I feel bad for all these addresses, but, uh, you know, they took a chance. And, uh, you know, if they're not within the, the rules, what are we doing? We're we going to change it for one? If you're going to set the precedent like that, well, you might as well fire it all out, your rules, in my opinion. And uh, that's where we're at right now, in my opinion, folks. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Next, on your second opportunity, Councillor Lauren Green. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I, um, I, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not looking to def to uh, defer this. I've tried to, I've tried that at the uh, last council meeting to defer. I'm not looking to postpone anything. I mean, it, Paul is following the orders here, the the rules and the regulations that we have. My only issue is that, um, you know, is if demolition is the only resolve and they're going to have their day in court, well, then we'll go that route and let them have their day in court. I'm not going to be here to fight for somebody, you know, that hasn't followed our, at least our procedures. So, Paul, I want you to understand that that's where I'm at with this. Um, you know, I, I respect the rules and regulations that we have in place. And, you know, at least they're going to get their day in court. And if they uh, if they can prove otherwise, well, then the court will rule in their favor. And if not, well, then we'll do what we have to do as a municipality and, uh, no, Paul, I just want to thank you for the report and the update on 21 and 23 um, McLeod Street and so far, because that's not the way I've gotten it. So it's it's nice to hear that at least we had some conversations with them. And if at the end of the day, you know, we're wrong or, or I shouldn't say wrong, if, if the courts rule against us, well, then we'll deal with it then. But I'm not in favor of postponing this, Madam Mayor. I, I think we uh, should vote on the motion and, and deal with it at hand and let the courts uh, make the decisions on it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Next, Councillor James Edwards. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and uh, I'll be brief. I'm along the same lines as uh, Councillor Green and uh, Brookswagger. There, um, you know, we're we're dealing with the uh, uh, we're having a discussion right now with the manager of building and planning and licensing laws. And in my uh, earlier um, uh, speech, I, I asked for a chronology of events, which he was very forthcoming in uh, giving. Uh, 
And, you know, uh, I'm sure already in this conversation, uh, our solicitor has uh, pitched in. Uh, I'm sure Mr. Burt doesn't work in a, uh, in a vacuum. Uh, uh, he has uh, uh, his rules and regulations to uh, follow. Uh, somebody else alluded to the uh, court process where the people uh, involved here will have their uh, opportunity to uh, uh, dispute uh, um, our recommendations. But uh, along with uh, Councillor Green, I'm prepared to uh, um, uh, vote on this uh, um, item right now. And uh, uh, again, uh, uh, Paul Burt, uh, uh, thanks very much for your um, uh, candor and your uh, explanation. I, I appreciate it. And uh, um, uh, again, there's there's a, a legal process that uh, the people can uh, follow. They will have their uh, recourse at, at that time. And uh, but I, I think we're uh, following our um, uh, procedures, and I'm uh, I'm good with that. So uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Bird, and thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, next, Deputy Mayor Early McMullen. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and I'm not going to repeat what has already been said. But I mean, they call <laughs> Gillespie calls me Policy E for a reason. Um, there are regulations in place, and I think, um, Paul, and, and thank you for all your work on the file, you, these files and your staff, um, where Mr. Bird has made it very clear that the reason he's bringing this to council is he's tried every other avenue allowable to him, and according to these regulations, this is his final kick at the can, and he needs permission from council to do that, and I think his his responsibility there is to show council that yes, I have done this, I've done this, I've done this, and, and this is where I feel we're ready to go. And I have full faith in that. Unfortunately, as a council, it, it is difficult to make decisions like this. Um, but what I can say is unlike other decisions I've had to make in the past, which I truly feel were much harsher, um, we are not making the final decision. All we are doing is saying, okay, this does meet the characteristics to move forward to litigation and the court will decide what they see fit in regards to each individual property. Um, and <clears throat> in fairness, at the beginning of this meeting, or I, I should say uh, Tuesday night when we were at this meeting, we had someone who was following the rules. It was in my district. They wanted a zoning amendment because they're trying to convert an apartment into a three bedroom, a, a three unit as opposed to a two unit. There's a lot of time that is taken up with that by the resident. There's a financial obligation that is taking up. So if we're encouraging and trying to get people to follow these processes and technically in the same meeting, trying to debate on whether, well, maybe this one, we could figure something out for them. It's really, it's inconsistent. And as a council, I really don't believe that is our responsibility. We're here to govern the rules and policies that are put in place. We do have the ability to alter those policies and to vote and change those policies, but we don't have the ability, I believe, or, or liability or legality to pick and choose who follows the policy and who doesn't. So I just want to reiterate that. Yes, it's difficult, but take into solace that we're not making the decision that this would be um, a legal decision up to the courts. And in fairness to our residents who do follow the processes, for us to decide or try to make some decision or try to find some lenience in a public forum based on particular addresses, I think is a very slippery slope and not one that I would like to take part in. So again, I'm gonna thank um, you, Paul. And uh, obviously I don't see any reason to put this off. This is simply, you know, it, it, it's policy oriented. So my question to you, Paul, is do you need a separate motion for each one of these properties or is it something that can be done in, in, in full? I would prefer a separate motion for each property and the motion be that we proceed with legal action for each one of the four properties listed. Okay, well, I can start that process. I'll start the process by putting a motion on the floor, Madam Mayor, to move forward with the process suggested by staff um, for 81 York Street. Moved by Deputy Mayor Erlene McMullen. Second. Oh, Second. seconded by Councillor Ken Tracy. Discussion on the motion. Question. I do, Madam Mayor. I'm on oh. speaker's list here. Sorry, so that's a new, I, I do have people who were in the previous queue, but on this motion, Councillor Steve Parsons, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I guess for me as Paul, I'm not against rules and regulations. I'm all for that. We all obey the rules. I got no problem with that. Everybody should be expected to follow it. And maybe this is a discussion for another time, maybe planning down the road, but I can't get it in my head and we hook somebody up with our services and then they come back to get a permit as far as the billing goes. 
I think it's got to work in tandem whereby if you, if you, if you bail a house a day, hooking up the water sewer is a part of the process. So why are we having two different distinct uh, regulations and rules if, if, and two different, there's a billing code and there's a planning code. I get that. But maybe marrying them together so you can't get hooked up in your water and sewer. So then an inspection is ensued to check out your billing. I just think something's array here in terms of if you hook me up, that means you're satisfied with what I'm doing because you hook me up, but I'm going to, I'm not going to give you a permit for the billing. That doesn't make sense to me somewhere along the line. But anyway, uh, we'll go from. Any further discussion on the motion, Councillor Eldon McDonald? Thanks very much, Madam Mayor. And I guess through you to the comments, uh, uh, Councillor Parsons just made, maybe can get some clarity from Paul. So um, I understand where it seems backwards in regards to hooking people up and permits and how things happen. So uh, I'll look at it from this point of view. If, if you have a permit to build a garage and you build it, and you, you have a workbench in there and you do crafts, whatever you're doing, uh, woodworking, and you decide you want to put a toilet and a sink in there. So you need sewer, you need water. So you can have that put in. And once that's put in, you now have your little bathroom there with your work area and whatever it is you're using the purpose of that building for uh, under the permit that was given. And then two years later, you decide that you're going to change that and you make an apartment. Well, the sewer and water is in there under the impression that you had a bathroom for your little work area. Well, now it's no longer a work area, it's an apartment, but, but the water and sewer is already there. So that, that's challenging when you the cart before the horse type of scenario. Um, I agree with a lot of the comments in regards to, uh, I come back to liability. Uh, Paul has done everything I think he can in regards to trying to work with the various uh, property owners. Um, to postpone this and to look at this uh, as, as you know, it, it's there and is there ways that we can find ways around working with them to make this work um, would be contravening the planning strategy. Even if they sent inspectors down there and everything was inspected and everything was built to a T, nothing's out of order, everything is perfect, the building doesn't still meet our planning strategy. Well, it would be my hope that, that, that you know, if, if this is approved to go to legal, which I, no one wants to, to make those decisions, but I, I don't think we have much of a choice here, uh, but that those residents will have an opportunity before it gets to court to further engage with their staff. Uh, and, and I'll use the word decommission it from uh, an apartment or a residential unit back down to a garage to where our, our, our staff are satisfied that there's no longer anyone living there. And, and because there, there was a permit to build the, the, the grass itself. So that, that's allowed. Um, and, and allow the property owner to work with us to help us work with them to accomplish their end goal. Decommission it down to that and then let the land, land, land strategy uh, plan come forward through CBRM forward and see where that falls. And if it falls that you're allowed to have accessory buildings, then they can re-engage the process, take their garage, turn it into an accessory unit. Uh, and it's gonna cost money to do that. But at the end of the day, it's not removed. It's not tore down. Uh, and, and I think if, if, if the property owners are willing to work with their staff and do everything we can to try to move that forward, uh, then they would be willing to do that with, with the hope that they would hope our strategy in the future will allow these buildings. Now, the thing is, we don't know that. The strategy for CBRM Forward may come back and say, no, we're not going to allow that. Well, they're going to have to have a garage for the rest of eternity uh, and won't be able to repurpose that for anything other than a garage. But to, to continue to not work with their staff uh, and to, to reject that and go to court and then a court order to have it removed and destroyed, then, it, then it's gone. And, 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 and I would hope that you know, there, there's a, a way forward, but we won't know until we finish our complete review of our, our planning strategy. And I would hope the homeowners and property owners would be willing, willing to work with our staff to, to look at their best interests of what they're trying to do. Of course, relying on that, we don't know what the end strategy is going to be, but we have to wait for that. So that's where I would be on this. But I think we have no other choice but to support staff's recommendation. Uh, and uh, hopefully between now and a court date, uh, there will be a compromise to try to, try to, to uh, move forward in a productive way. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. On the motion, Councillor Darren O'Quinn. 
Yeah, I guess. Um, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I guess uh, uh, Councilor McDonald was wondering if they had a water meter hooked up. They did since 2019, since the summer. I, I just do. I, I agree with Councilor Burns. This one is a little different for me. Like the fact that they, they they they've done everything. Like they paid their bill for like two and a half years. I mean, I find it a little different. And, and I really think if if we hooked up did the hookup for them and we took their money. I just find it's a little different and maybe Elder, it makes a good points, but maybe it could be decommissioned back to a garage and then hopefully someday built back into a, a residential property. I just find this one a little differently. I still don't know where I'm at with this one. I just wanted to make it aware that they did have a water meter since 2019 and it was hooked up by a plumber and CBRM were aware. So thank you. Any further discussion on the motion? And for clarity, this motion is pertaining to just the first property on the list. Oh, sorry, Councilor Darren Brookschweiger. If uh, people heard what I said, but you're allowed to hook up a sewer and water line to an accessory building. You don't need a permit for that. If you build a garage, you can still put in water and sewer. You don't lay there to sleep there. You don't live in there. It's an accessory building. So all this other talk, uh, I'm not really sure if anybody heard what I said, and maybe Wayne McDonald or somebody can confirm that from Public Works, but that was my understanding. I think there was one hooked up recently that I'm aware of in, in the area. So, you know, I, and Paul, please elaborate more on the difference that maybe, well, yeah, I don't want you to. I don't want you to talk about the conversation with the homeowners. I really think that that's the reason why, Mayor, as you pointed out earlier, there are certain things that have to be done in camera. And, uh, and that's for clarity purposes and for the sake of somebody saying the wrong thing that could get yourself in trouble or, or ourselves in trouble. So... Um, anyway, I hope that's a little more clear and maybe somebody else in public works can understand that or explain that a little better. Director McDonald, I'm, I'm just going through the list here. I'm not sure if he is. I don't believe he is on no, the is home uh, for personal reasons. Oh, my apologies. Okay. So at this point, I'm not sure who we would refer that question to. I'm just going through the meeting attendee list. Director Roos is here, but I'm, I, I'm not sure if that would be a fair question to pose to Director Roos because that is not his department. Um, Madam CEO, who do you suggest? I'm just looking through uh, the list. Um, I'm pretty confident in Councilor Brookswager's comments um, that you can, in fact, get that without a permit in an auxiliary building. Um, Director Roos, are you familiar with that? Yeah, I would echo Paul's earlier statements um, and Councilor Brookswager that, uh, yeah, I mean, you can get a, the land use bylaw allows you to get a uh, water hookup um, to your accessory building. So I'm not sure why that's relevant here. Okay. We have a couple more people on the speakers list. Uh, Councillor. Okay, we just went to Councillor Darren Brookschweiger. I'm sorry, I'm trying to keep track of this chat here, folks. Councillor Gordon McDonald. Thanks, Madam Mayor. And, uh, you know, I, I too actually like to uh, stick to the policies and not, and I don't really prefer to be deviating from them. So I kind of do agree with what uh, Councillor Brockswager has been putting forward. I also agree with um, uh, Deputy Mayor Early McMullen when she indicated that it won't be us making the decision. And all these d arguments that uh, uh, Councillor are making for these properties, which is admirable to be able to, you know, to support these, these individuals. But um, you know, when, when you get to the court situation, all these arguments can be made to the, to the judge and to the courts, uh, you know, uh, any options that they have, uh, they may have the, or suggestions they may have. Um, I'm sure they will be, uh, certainly, um, considered by, 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 by the courts and, uh, through any, and, and the CBRM will also be there present to uh, have any of those questions posed to them. So. Um, you know, it, it's a process. Uh, it's it's kind of like when you're hitting the age of 65. Well, you know, some people hit it 
earlier and you can't say I'm well, on it the day before because you know there's a deadline date. You know, you just have to go with the flow. So um, I, yeah, I, I think uh, Paul's done a good job in, in, in explaining how the, how things uh, should be going in these departments. And, uh, and I believe if we can convince our residents to follow the policies as they are, they won't be running into these difficulties when, you know, they invest a lot of money in certain, uh, certain projects that they want to uh, push forward. So uh, thanks again, Paul, and I'll be uh, supporting your motion. Okay, thank you, Council Gordon McDonald. Next, Councilor Lauren Green. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I can say unequivocally that you can get a water and sewer hooked up in a utility building in a garage, because I've done that, Darren, and it's not converted into an apartment. Um, that's the issue here. It's it's conversion of a of an accessory building. It's not about the water hookup. It's just simply a conversion of an accessory building to a dwelling. So I'm comfortable with your explanation, Paul, and I and I know without a fact without a doubt, sorry, that you can get water and sewer hooked up to a garage, but however, you cannot turn that garage into a living quarters. So I'm prepared to vote for this motion and I call for the question, Madam Mayor. Okay, Council. Question has been called. All those in favor of the motion regarding 81 York Street, please signify by saying aye. 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 Contrary, nay. Motion is carried. Thank you, Council. Okay, when it comes to, and I apologize, I know we have kind of gone back and forth a bit. I've lost track of trying to figure out who was in the previous uh, queue to speak. It's, it's really difficult, and I, I just want to explain to the public, it's really difficult to keep track uh, virtually. Uh, Council James Edwards, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And um, is, uh... It, it, it's are we going to vote on uh, each property separately or are we prepared yeah. to uh, vote on the entire no. recommendation the one recommendation by uh, no. uh, manager e bird no it's manager bird or paul bird had requested uh, a motion for each property counselor okay okay so i move the second uh, property then so that would be property 2123 mcleod street and south bar Second. Second. Seconded by Councillor Glenn Perouche. Discussion on the motion? Question. Question. Question has been called. Council, sorry. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Contrary, nay. Motion is carried. Next property on the list is property 50 Charlotte Street in Sydney. Madam Mayor, I would move that we uh, accept the recommendation for Paul for uh, 50 Charlotte Street. Second. Okay, moved by Councillor Lauren Green, seconded by Councillor <laughs> Sam McDonald. Discussion on that motion? Question. Question has been called. All those in favor, please Madam signify. Mayor. Madam Mayor, I believe uh, Councillor Alden McDonald had a question Sorry. on that motion. Sorry, I thought that was from the previous list vote. Go ahead, go ahead, Councillor. Thanks very much, Madam Mayor. No, it's very difficult to uh, to try to keep track of all of it, especially when you're in and out of motion. So I appreciate that, but I, I did get it in before the question was called. Yeah. Um, I just want to make, I guess, some general comments. Uh, it's unfortunate that that you know all of these cases have to go before court, but um, I, I can say that I have had discussions with the owner of this property uh, several years ago, probably three, maybe four, because COVID's here two years. Uh, and uh, at that time uh, had indicated that he would take some steps to improve upon the, the building that was there. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, there's been nothing done with that building since it was, was uh, placed there. Um, recognizing that I know staff get complaints. I've had people raise it with me uh, in public. Uh, I've had people raise it uh, with me on the doorsteps uh, when I've been campaigning. Uh, what people have to realize, and in particular, I guess the property owner, and I, I'm, I do know the property owner personally, or you know, best friends or anything, but I, I do know him. Uh, and uh, what we have to respect here is that there's a North End strategy put in place. It was put in place uh, by the residents of the North End who came together, who wanted to improve upon their community in the North End. Uh, regulations were put in place. Those uh, regulations were. Uh, public consultation over a two-year period to come to a final document that, that the people in the North End asked our municipality to help them put in place. 
our municipality support him with that. Uh, and I think it was 2006, if I remember correctly, that that document may have come before council for approval uh, based on the request of the residents in the north end at that time. So this is this is a is a is a sensitive, uh, I guess, topic for some of the people that were involved in those discussions and, and want to improve upon it and put those regulations in place. So it's unfortunate uh, that the homeowner uh, wasn't able to uh, take some steps to to alleviate the concerns and problems and to see if we could have something that would be workable there. But uh, I know my discussions, uh, his intentions was to take some steps to move forward, uh, to improve upon what was there. And unfortunately that hasn't happened. And I've been criticized myself many times for, for doing nothing and ignoring it and letting him get away with everything he wants to do. And, and that's not the case. It's not my job to be involved in that. Uh, it's staff's job to be involved in that. And they've kept me pretty well informed uh, over the years on, on this particular topic. So it's unfortunate, but uh, this is the way this is gonna have to go. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any further discussion on the motion? Question. Question has been called. Council, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Contrary nay. Motion is carried. Final property that is up for question 41 third street glace bay i move it madam mayor second mayor moved by councilor darren brookschweiger seconded by councilor ken tracy discussion on that motion question question has been called all those in favor please signify by saying aye aye aye, aye. aye. contrary nay motion is carried uh thank you paul for providing an opportunity for so much discussion. Uh, and thank you, Council, for, again, for your ongoing patience in uh, my attempt to chair virtual meetings. It's, yeah, I don't mean to skip over people and not follow lists, but it's a, it's definitely a challenge. I, I would like to add before we conclude this, this portion of our agenda that um, I, I will be having further discussion with staff um, on how, on how we move forward with these types of situations, uh, in the future, because there will be more. Um, as we were talking, there's so much development happening. People are recognizing when perhaps buildings are not being used for their intention or being permitted correctly. Like our appeals process, there is a way that we can have detailed conversation that is respectful of the residents uh, and, and their personal information. So I, I am going to be having those conversations because there are parts of this conversation today I very much am not comfortable with um, having had in the public realm. No, nothing on you, Paul, that is, this is, this is, I don't wanna say a new process because we have gone through this before, but if there's going to be more, I would like to have procedures in place to ha have a bit more um, privacy if that's possible. Thank you. Okay. Really sorry, I have misplaced my agenda here. Uh, I do believe we are, he oh, here it is, sorry. Next, we're moving to item 11 on our agenda committee reports. Item 11.1 .1 is NSFM Board of Directors. This is going to be a report presented by Councillor Eldon McDonald. Thanks very much, Madam Mayor. And everyone has my report in the agenda there. Uh, I will just briefly just kind of touch on some things in the uh, spirit of time. It's 10 to 5 and staff are beyond their their 4.30 day uh, and end of day. So I will just briefly touch on some of the things. So some of the things the NFM, NSFM have, has uh, discussed and covered in the last year uh, was of course, uh, we're all living through COVID and NSM members received various updates on the, strata, on the status of the virus and the rollout along with uh, long-term care facilities, fire departments, police departments, and other departments uh, that require personal interaction such as our masking and public transit and issues such as that. Now, the economic spin-off uh, in regards to what COVID has done to our, our, our economy uh, has been discussed and the future economic forecasts uh, will be mid for mid and post uh, pandemic were discussed to the unemployment measures uh, taken by the provincial government to assist buildings to try to get them through these difficult times. So we've had numerous discussions on those over the past year. Uh, of course, housing is key to our municipalities across the province and numerous meetings took place involving the NSFM members. Uh, government ministers, deputy ministers, and staff regarding housing issues across the entire province. 
Uh, other concerns raised regarding housing were the impact of short-term rentals on supply of affordable rental housing, uh, make, making unused lanes available for affordable housing development, the use of taxation to reduce pressure on the rental markets, and the lack of developers uh, in developing uh, affordable rentals uh, in the rural area is also a concern that has been discussed and raised. Uh, discussions also took place regarding housing costs related to municipalities and the potential of downloading. Uh, municipalities are nervous of these costs being downloaded. And there's a need for the review of the NGA and the Halifax uh, Municipal Charter based on the ability for municipalities to have the authority to support housing opportunities, but to avoid unintended consequences. Uh, very much that some municipalities are in a financial capacity to be able to uh, address some of these concerns where some municipalities aren't and, and there could be negative uh, consequences. Um, and providing this, we want the province to provide tools for municipalities and adequate resources for finances to support the housing uh, affordability market. Uh, accessibility legislation, there's been committees created across the province that involve uh, government councillors, staff and citizen appointees. Uh, mandatory legislation and the downloading of accessible costs is a major concern to municipalities and businesses and property owners with limited capacity. Again, it comes back to the thing of having the ability to do the work and paid uh, municipalities help pay for that um, is, is easier for some municipalities than others. And uh, there's municipalities that are concerned that this accessibility uh, cost will be downloaded. So uh, a lot of concerns involved in that. We also had a provincial strategy when the provincial ele election was to happen. Uh, we had a strategy for pre-election uh, communications to the membership and so, uh, for insight to creating the strategy, reviewed party platforms and aligned the NSM objectives for our approach and strategic rollout of the various aspects of the plan over the duration of the four week campaign. Uh, and uh, we also have had discussions on, on funding revenue, such as cannabis. The NSFM continues to advocate to the provincial government to establish a fair and equitable distribution formula for cannabis revenue. Uh, the legislation of cannabis is creating a new revenue source for both uh, the provincial and federal governments, yet municipalities are incurring significant portions of associated costs with no compensation. Uh, NSFM will continue to advocate uh, the, uh, an approach that cannabis is a new source of revenue and that the province uh, provide municipalities with a substantial share of all the related tax revenues uh, from this source. The province needs to collaborate with municipalities in establishing a fair and equitable funding formula and all municipalities receive a fair share of that new funding stream. Uh, the capped assessment program has also been discussed. The NSFM has and will continue to raise the issue of the cap program with the provincial government at every opportunity made available. It remains the view of the NSFM that the property cap distorts the property tax system. The cap is detrimental to new growth and the successes of municipalities across the province. The study was uh, completed uh, on the municipal property tax uh, taxation in Nova Scotia by academic experts Harry Kitchen and Ina Chack Slack um, and uh, recommended the phase out of this program and we still consider to pursue that. Uh, and uh, it's, not, it's not clear that homeowners uh, sorry, it's not clear that most homeowners of property tax that need property tax relief are the ones that are benefiting from the program. Uh, opportunities are available for the province to work with municipalities and other stakeholders uh, to phase out the cap program and provide a better alternative to protect low income homeowners and those experience significant increases in the property tax assessments. Uh, also, we've discussed the uh, extender uh, producer responsibility EPR. Uh, that uh, also has been a topic around the table for quite some time uh, for the printed paper pro uh, packaging. And the implementation of the EPR program will significantly reduce both costs and, and risks associated with municipalities' curbside recycling programs. The NSFM believes that the work uh, completed in this file will see the current government pass legislation for EPR uh, for PPP in the near future. And I know, Madam Mayor, you have spent a great deal of time and effort in making sure that that comes forward. And hopefully we'll have good news on that in this uh, coming year. Uh, municipal funding is always a topic within the NSFM. The NSFM continues to advocate for fair distribution of various government programs. As referenced earlier, the cannabis revenue NSFM has and will continue to advocate for the fair distribution of the provincial ca capacity grant, formerly known as equalization. That uh, remains the position of the NSFM that the province increase its annual funding for the municipality's equalization program by a minimum of $20 million over a three-year period. 
uh, operational costs uh, rise uh, due to the factor beyond municipal control, uh, municipal, municipalities controls, and the provincial financial support has not kept pace. Uh, the NSFM has advocated to all parties previous, uh, in previous elections and the past election that this program needs to be reviewed. The current government of Tim Houston has allotted, as we discussed earlier today, a $15 million top up to the, uh, this year's program, which is greatly appreciated and greatly needed and is committed to doing an in-depth review to identify a fair funding formula for distribution of that formula going forward. The NFSFM has also advocated to the federal government uh, to continue the doubling of the gas tax funding formula to assist municipalities in addressing their infrastructure deficits. And we see that that happened this year and hopefully that will continue in the future also. Uh, there was a review of the code of conduct for an SFM and there was a substantial uh, review of that and uh, the document has been finalized and waiting for government to uh, pass that in, in the legislature. Uh, the last thing I'll touch on is we also discussed earlier was road funding. The NSFN continues to advocate for the province to provide uh, equitable funding to towns and municipalities containing former towns for their share of arterial and collector roads. Rural municipalities make financial contributions to the province for the maintenance of J-class roads and there is significant provincial funding to there is, there is insignificant provincial funding to maintain these roads. The MSFM will continue to advocate to the province to increase the transportation budget to build a strong road network, which is essential to the province and its residents for economic, social, and educational health reasons, and increase investment in these roads is required. It is encouraging to see that the current government has committed to funding the gravel road construction program and the rural impact mitigation fund, which will be doubled this year, which is another great thing for our, our, our roads. And we greatly appreciate the Houston government for taking those initiatives. Uh, and uh, last but not least, um, more uh, permanent funding arrangements will be determined by the uh, mandated renegotiation of the memorandum of understanding and the review of the Municipal Government Act. And I respect that uh, respectfully. And we will continue uh, on the road with the NSM to advocate, facilitate, and collaborate with all municipalities and the provincial and federal governments going forward for the betterment of our communities. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor. That was a great report. Um, I, I love the sharing and, and the teaching that this type of conversation can offer. Councillor Darren Brookschweiger, did you want to make a comment? Uh, thanks, Mayor. Just quickly, I want to thank uh, Eldon for the update. It's uh, it's nice to see that the good work is continuing at the NSFM level. Uh, the funding thing, just one correction. Uh, Houston actually uh, put in $35 million, uh, this year. He doubled uh, equalization for all units in the province, which is something I believe is worthy of conversation. I, I really... Uh, I never thought I'd see it in my time. I'm really glad that it has happened. And uh, many of us over the years were on the floor at the UNSM conferences uh, speaking about this. And to finally see this come to fruition is uh, just a great, great piece of work. And I'm hoping it'll continue. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you very much. Seeing no further comments. Um, Councillor Cyril McDonald had to leave. Uh, and so what I'm going to do is suggest that the Nova Scotia Solid Ways Resource Management uh, report be moved to our next agenda. Uh, lots going on there, complementing what uh, Councillor Elder McDonald was talking about in terms of EPR. So we will move that to the next meeting. Uh, item 12, financial statements, Jennifer Campbell. Welcome back to the virtual platform. Item 12.1 is CBRM financials to November 30th, uh, 2021. Yeah, no, the, thank you, Mayor. The financial reports are included in your, in your agenda package for information purposes. I'm happy to answer any questions. So I'll open it up uh, for item 12.1 and 12.2 at the same time. So if anybody has any questions regarding our CBRM financial statements or the Port of City Development Corporation statements. Again, they're for information purposes only, but welcome questions. Okay, seeing none, I'm just gonna review a few of the actions from our meeting today and uh, gosh, last week when we started it, right? Um, of course, we talked very in depth uh, about the important flood mitigation issues that need to be ident 
to be worked on, quite frankly. So uh, it was advised uh, or requested that my target help identify some of the community resources uh, and funding that is available out there and bring that back to council so we can have further discussions on what types of mitigations we can look into. We don't know what is available until we know what money is out there. Um, it was also suggested that we bring together by way of a special meeting uh, representatives from provincial, federal and municipal government to talk about further uh, mitigation projects. So if there's not funding out there, how can we get our provincial and federal counterparts to advocate for more? Uh, invite ACAP Cape Breton to help with additional homeowner programs, uh, specifically the safe diversion of water from properties and the unhooking um, of drainage to, from our municipal service, our sewer systems. It was also um, asked if we could invite the engineers who initially developed the CBCL report back to help us review those flood mitigation options that were previously presented to us. Um, District Energy, uh, there was a request for additional information, specifically more uh, business case uh, detail, I suppose you could say, around that project and have a full presentation to council. Uh, a workshop was requested regarding the recreation master plan, and I know staff are already uh, on that, getting that into the works. Reach out to Provincial Roads Committee. That's what I will do. Uh, specifically to Emily Lutz, I know one of my colleagues on NSFM who is a part of that, to see what type of information can be taken from that committee to help educate our council. And finally, this is something we didn't talk about, but we've been chatting about because we've had to split up our meeting uh, today. I'm sorry, 8.3. I'm just looking in the chart, sorry. Uh, we, we do need to talk about how how we manage our meetings. Uh, clearly splitting up a meeting over two days is too much. So I'm going to consult with staff a little bit and talk about maybe we split it up and say, one afternoon we have planning issues at the other afternoon we have, I'm not sure, but let me get back to staff on that. Uh, Councillor Gillespie, you mentioned 8.3. Yes, my mistake. That that was yeah. removed. Yes. Okay, right. That yeah, that was removed previously removed from the agenda. Again, it's okay. It's, it's, it threw me for a, loop over a couple of days, right? Yeah. <laughs> no. Exactly. Okay. Uh seeing no further questions, discussions. Um, thank you all for participating over the course of a couple of days. Uh we'll get back with some of those action items.